Uh, good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you to the 25th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Can I remind everybody present to make sure that they switch off all electronic devices uh, because they do interfere with the broadcasting system. Um, uh, our first item today is to hear evidence as part of our scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16, which will focus on school spending. We'll hear evidence from two panels of witness today, uh, starting with the views of parents and young people, after which we'll hear from uh, the trade unions. Uh, can I welcome to committee this morning uh, Ian Ellis, MBE, from the National Parent Forum of Scotland, Ellen Pryor from the Scottish Parent Teaching Council, uh, Louise Cameron from the Scottish Youth Parliament, and Susan Hunter from Youth Link Scotland. Uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for your written submissions, which uh, the committee have received, uh, and they've obviously been very useful in setting out your views uh, for this morning's evidence session. Uh, we have got a lot of issues, obviously, that we want to get through today. Um, so I'm going to move straight to questions, uh, and members are keen to get involved in this, I I'm sure. So I'm going to start with Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I just, uh, first of all, ask an opening uh, question to all of you? Um, uh, I wonder if you can give examples of the kind of budgetary pressures that you're aware of in schools, uh, and also if you could give an example of how this impacts on pupils' education and perhaps, uh, Ian, if I may come to you first, because I was struck by your evidence, uh, paragraph 2.4 and 2.5, where you say that uh, schools are increasingly expected to fundraise uh, for essential items such as pencils and paper. So can you give us an, ex give us an example of schools where uh, they have to fundraise to get their own pencils and paper? Uh, in your response, thank you. Uh, I can't give you the, the exact schools if you're looking for the exact schools, but the big thing is because the, the cuts and stuff that they've got is there isn't much flexibility in the money when the, the school actually gets their funding because the majority of it is towards staff costs and, and the, the upkeep of the school. So you, you're then looking at the priorities of getting material, course material for so it then just it filters down and what's the least thing to supply and it's pencils and papers and stuff. Tell us which local authority uh, have that. to raise, my parents have to raise money to get pencils and paper. Could you perhaps tell us, or, or is it all local authorities? I don't know. I wouldn't say it's all, but it's, it's some. I know my own Western Barton, a couple of schools have done it. Uh, and the parent council and the PTA have actually had to raise money and because of the, the savings they've had to make. Western Barton, is that the only one you're, you're aware of? That's the one that I have. My, the problem is some of these are from my reps. It's all been collated. It's uh, just to send you your evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Western Barton, I know of a couple of schools that have done it. The okay. fact that the parent council have had to, I'm sure probably Eileen's got probably some okay. more. So it's just to give an example of yeah. budgetary pressures and how this is affecting people's but education. It's just when you, when you break it all down, there's very... There's not much of the the budget left that schools can actually use. And then when they actually get that, and then they've actually got to make management savings on top of that. So it makes it even harder. So the budget just gets cut. They're given an allocation then, well, by the way, there's another management saving you need to make on top of that. And it's just not sustainable. So, sorry, convener, but it's just that what should money be spent on that, it, that, is, that it's not being spent on? You know, with the cuts that you mentioned, pencils and paper is one. What else should be provided that is not being provided due to these budgetary well, pressures? Well, we're just about to go into the new hires. So there's going to be new resources needed. There's no, not enough funding to, to supply all the resources that we need for the children. I mean, when children are starting to share books by one to one and one to three, it's, it's, doesn't it, it doesn't work. And this is the big restraint we're now under. All these new resources, the money's just not there to fund the new resources that are coming out. And then to actually start looking and replacing old resources. The kids are going home with books that are taped together. The other kids from years gone by have scribbled wee notes on. And it's, so there's just no money left. And you feel this may be detrimental to pupils' education in terms of uh, approaching the new hire? Oh, definitely. Not just the new hire, but everything. Well, it just you gave that example. Thank yeah. you. Can I... <coughs> Quite something. Sorry, Mary, just want to clear something up. Um, 
Mr. Ellis, could you name a time when um, that didn't happen? What you just said. When I was at school, and it wasn't yesterday, um, pupils shared books, one to two or even one to three. Uh, books were taped up because they were old and the, the spine was broken. The Previous just, pupils had written in all the margins and... I mean, I have to be honest and say that that's, that's my, what you've described as my memory of school. And also, uh, pupils were asked if it was possible your parents could afford it, could perhaps you buy you know, the, the text for this particular you know, play we're doing in English. So that wasn't yesterday. I know it wasn't yesterday, but when I was at school 20 years ago, I had my own books. Uh, and it's just the state they're getting in now, they can't even replace them. So if you even say if it was a one to two, it's now a one to three because of the state of the books, it's just not... The, and the thing is, the way Scottish education is, and what we're wanting Scottish education to be, is that good enough for a one to three? No, no, that's not my point. I, I, I agree it's not good enough, but my, my point is that when I was at school, um, one to three sharing, parents having to raise money to su supply extra books and material, old books, books being taped up, was, was the norm. It, it, it was it was happening then, over yeah. thirty or forty years ago, and I'm just asking you, you know, oh. what you why you think that's new in any way? Because it's because parents are now bringing it to light and saying, and the other question they're saying is why should we? Is that not part of your education? Why should parents then have to supply stuff? Wait, can, I, mm -hmm. can I come in? We're supposed to have a system of education which is free at the point of delivery. We don't. So on, on two levels, we have individual parents who are having to find money to um, pay for materials or trips or um, whatever for the young people. Now, we know that that has an impact. If you, if you read the Children's Commissioner's report earlier this year, young people self-select. So if they are looking at subject choices and they know they come from a household where there is little money, they will not take subjects which require those additional resources. So they will avoid technical subjects and practical subjects. They will not put themselves forward for school trips because they know their parents can't afford them. So on an individual basis, we impact on families and on the education of young people. As far as parent groups are concerned, absolutely. We have been tracking for a number of years. Parent groups are raising funds, not for frills, not for, for ribbons and, and fancy things, but for fundamental resources. IT equipment is a key one. So, you know, um, smart boards, laptops, iPads, tablets, that kind of thing. So parent groups are funding things which would normally, would have previously been included within the school's budget. And that is across the board. That is all over. Um, so at the Scottish Youth Parliament, we consult directly with young people and recently we've done a consultation. Um, our Education and Lifelong Learning Committee has done a consultation with young people on this and um, we submitted a full copy of the evidence to your committee. Um, and what we found was that um, young people were, were very happy with Curriculum for Excellence and they liked it, but they felt that there were some issues with the implementation and they felt that maybe teachers could have been a, perhaps a little bit better prepared and also there wasn't enough resources to coincide with the education but um, in terms of um, the, the content of Curriculum for Excellence they've been relatively happy and um, it's been you know we feel that um, perhaps the committee could look at um, maybe putting um, a bit of thought into the resources going into it because it would be preventative spending and we feel that if um, you, this was looked at that you know it would it would benefit in the future because the you know the more we put into education um, it will come back in the future and the spending will go, go back into the economy. So. Recent budgetary pressures have impacted on the implementation of curriculum for excellence. Yes, yeah. um, so a concern that we have is that um, it would appear that the spending is going to struggle over the next year and we think that maybe if we um, resolve these issues with resourcing now then it would you know it would um, benefit in the long run thank you um, 
Youth Link Scotland represents the, our membership of over 100 organisations, both in the voluntary and statutory um, sector in our local authorities. Um, I think the, the experience that we have is that the budgetary pressures on school is the impact on, on not on teacher numbers directly, but the amount of time teachers have to invest in partnership working with youth work practitioners um, to deliver the outcomes of Curriculum for Excellence, giving the young people the principles of breadth, um, progression, personalisation and choice, and youth work offers offers that and there's really good examples of youth work in schools programs where those opportunities um, need to be there but it requires teacher time both in the planning um, and also in times in the delivery delivery of that uh, question uh, convener and i'm a member of the audit committee so forgive me if i uh, am a bit of an anorak uh, from there but they did do a very good report which i've no doubt you've all read uh, on school education uh, earlier this year. And uh, I'll just lump my two questions together. And uh, it's really that, uh, and I'll quote from the report, some schools have achieved better attainment results than their level of deprivation would indicate, suggesting that the gap between lowest and highest performing schools cannot be wholly attributed to different levels of deprivation. So I'd be very pleased to hear your views. We had a very good debate last week in Parliament on uh, levels of attainment, hear your views on what we could do. And I know the committee's doing an inquiry into uh, uh, deprivation, what we could do to narrow that gap. And my second point, convener, is um, from the same report, the Audit Scotland report, it's paragraph 33, uh, and I'll just quote again. At a council level, there is no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring the progress of pupils from primary one to S3. Now, it doesn't mean to say they're not being tracked. It just means there's no consistent approach. And it's really you know, to help us understand that every pupil gets the, the best chance. So I just wonder if I could ask you to address those two points of view. Uh, other than deprivation, uh, what affects pupils' attainment? And secondly, should we have a more consistent approach to tracking pupils? Uh, because we know that reading and maths uh, competence levels seem to deteriorate from P1, P2 into secondary schools. So uh, just your views on those two points. Thank you. Can I answer? Um, the, I mean, the two key things which impact on attainment for young people are parental engagement and quality of teaching. You know, it, that's not rocket science. It's out there. We all know that that's the reality. I mean, we pointed out in our paper that we've got to have a clear, clear eye on the difference between parental involvement and parental engagement. Schools can do a great deal to support parental engagement and parent groups, parent councils, PTAs, can do a great deal to support parental engagement. But, you know, the, the, the prize of all of this is that parents engage with their children's learning and that improves attainment. Quality of teaching, quality of leadership within the school environment is absolutely key. And the reason that you have such disparity between different schools in different areas with the same level of deprivation is the quality of leadership, the quality of teaching, and the way in which the families in those communities are engaged. You know, I, th I think that, that that is a lot of it. It's not all of it, but that is a lot of it. Um, as far as the, the, the tracking of young people is concerned, um, you know, as a, as a culture, we, we, we are obsessed, aren't we, with measuring the pig? You know, we will weigh it, and we will weigh it, and we will weigh it, and it will still weigh the same tomorrow as it weighs today. We, we've, if we use... Um, you know, assessment as a way of, of weighing the pig just so that we can we can note that down. We know that, that schools are struggling with the amount of paperwork, with the amount of bureaucracy that's already on them. We've got to be extremely cautious, I think, about putting in further measures for attainment. I think that, that teachers know their young people. I think if, if, we, if we have to look at ways in which attainment is measured then we have to look at working with teachers to implement something which is low-tech, low-bureaucracy, so that we can do that, that tracking. But I don't think it needs to be done nationally. I think it needs to be done locally, and it needs to be done under the eyes of a vigilant local authority and a vigilant head teacher, and with the cooperation of parents. 
to say, convener, I was very careful to quote from the report because I was not suggesting more testing, more bureaucracy. I was very careful. Mm -hmm. And what I was asking, or what I talked about, and I don't want to read any more, wasn't about weighing the pig, as you say. It's yeah. comparing one school with another. That is what the Auditor General was helpful. saying. But can I just go back and say, I, I'm quite concerned. I un appreciate parental engagement, but I'm quite concerned what you're saying about the quality of teaching. Is, I, I, that, a, is that affected by budgetary pressures? Or? I'm not saying... Um, I wasn't saying that was affected by budgetary pressures. What I'm saying is those are the two things... That, that give you high attaining young people. Quality of teaching and parental engagement, those are key factors. Um, you know, this is separate from budgetary pressures. Of course, budgeting um, has an impact on the teaching population. Of course it does. Um, Do you have concerns about the quality of teaching? You've mentioned it quite often. I, I, I think that there are concerns about the quality of teaching. You know, I think that... that um, all parents can cite examples in their children's schools of worries around quality of teaching. We've come a long way. I think we've got a long way to go. What should, okay. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what Eileen was saying, but I think from the, what is attainment is, is one big issue I've got. And attainment from one school to another, and attainment in a deprived area might be just the kids turning up at school. That's raising attainment because you're actually getting them in school. It could be how many national fives have people got. And I think we need to maybe look at some sort of standardisation of what actually is attainment. I don't think it's good enough just to say to an authority, what is your attainment? Because they'll, they can give you all different answers. It puts the destination of school leavers. That's an attainment level. We don't actually specifically ask, what is your destination of school leavers? And get a, a chart. We ask how many kids get national fives, five national fives. That's only like twenty percent of the children that in that year group that actually sit and get these. What about the eighty percent? And that is where we're beginning to lose out. And if we start cutting budgets, what we're talking about is, of course, attainment's going to drop, and we're never going to get the gap because under Criterion for Excellence, the, the high flyers in the school. You've got to help them, so that they're still going to rise. And even if you're helping the bottom, it's just going to move at the same level. How are you actually going to bridge that gap? And it leads then on to your quality of teaching. And it is, we need quality teachers. And there is issues with teachers across the country. Uh, the GTCS is beginning to deal with, with some problems. And, and God forbid, we've seen the days that they've actually got rid of some teachers I used to call teachers bomb-proof because you couldn't get rid of them once you were on a job, and that was them. But we're now beginning to look at it and sort this out, and we're beginning to get quality teachers through. And the new teachers that are coming through under Curriculum for Excellence, through the colleges, you, you see them, and it's night and day when you see some of these young teachers coming through the system. And some of the ideas that they're, they're using to bring the kids on is just really it's mind-blowing. And I think the big issue is if budget restraints start to kick in, then I honestly think just now it's going to, it could turn into a postcode lottery because some authorities work far better with their budgets than others. And you begin to see gaps across the country. Where, or it, there is bits where some authorities, some kids are paid more or to fund them for the year than others. A lot of the, it's cuts. In the last three years, there's been cuts, not a lot to education. The next three years, there's going to be serious cuts to education because a lot of the authority other departments have been cut to the bone. And how do they make savings in education? Now, the bus trip down the road, making it just statutory, that's not much of a saving. The only way to make serious savings in education is through staffing, and school closures, neither of which are acceptable to parents. And if we're going to actually look at proper, if you want curriculum for excellence to go on the road that we're going, which is one of the could be one of the best systems in the world, I think if we pull the carpet from under this now, then I think there's a good chance we'll end up back down the, the ladder, a big step. Okay. Thank you, Mr. 
jobs. Um, I know Gordon MacDonald wants to come in at this point. Gordon. Okay, thanks very much, convener. Eileen, in your opening um, answers to, to Mary's questions, you said that uh, households with little money, um, disadvantaged children were uh, not choosing subjects uh, in relation to costs and school trips. Um, one, I was going to say, what evidence is there of that? And secondly, um, the Scottish Government during the summer announced the, a new funding for access to education, which allows schools to um, apply for up to £5,000 to help disadvantaged children. So, again, um, you know, how aware are, are schools of this fund and what is the take-up of that fund? That fund was actually announced at the launch of the report from the Children's Commissioner mm -hmm. and Save the Children, mm -hmm. which identified this as an issue. Mm -hmm. So identified that young people were were self-select were self-selecting. They were avoiding subjects right. which would cost their families money. So we we are already um, dis discarding those young people from the career choices that they want to make, and that I think is fundamentally unfair. As for how aware schools are of the fund, I don't know. I think you have to talk to the teachers' unions right. about that because that's a that is a that would that's school based, right. not focused on families. But you know, I think that that you know that rests at the discretion of schools mm -hmm. that doesn't rest with families that doesn't yeah. that doesn't impact on what's going on in the whole but if schools were aware of, of the funds existence they could obviously make families aware that this yeah, fund absolutely. is available absolutely. and would you agree that this would help offset part of the I'm problem? sure I'm sure it will help mm -hmm. um I don't know if it'll help enough I, I, I just don't know um and I think you're going to have to get a sense from the the the, the teachers unions and and the head teachers as to whether they feel that that's made sufficient impact. Right. Um, we've talked about the um, pressures on school budgets, and you know we're all aware that um, public authorities are under a great deal of pressure uh, financially. But um, Audit Scotland's report um, about um, school education issued in June of this year, one of their key messages on, on point two was that performance has improved against all 10 of the attainment measures we examined over the last decade. So how does that tie in with people's view that um, the, the budgetary pressures are, are having an effect on education when they've quite clearly said that it's actually improving, attainment's actually improving? Well, I mean, I think you, you know, you're not necessarily comparing apples with pears. You know, that's one thing, the, and the means in which we measure attainment in different countries is different. So, you know, you can't you can't simply look at attainment levels here and compare them directly with elsewhere. Our teaching methods are different, our curricula are different, um, and our means of measurement are different. So, you know, I think you have to say that these are broad... Scotland yeah. is improving. Yes, and I think that's right, and I think that's a testament to hard work of schools, hard work of teachers, and hard work of young people. You know, and I don't think that, that there's any doubt we are we are starting to to move up, if you like, and and we are to to pick up one of Ian's points. We are taking on board wider achievement as opposed to simply academic attainment, and that is extremely important. Um, but you know, local authorities. Yes, they have been. They have been cutting. They have been cutting for quite some years, and you see it at, um, at head office, if you like, um, because the, the staffing levels within education departments or whatever kind of department they are, because they're all actually multifunction now. The, the number of quality improvement officers has really dropped, and you'll see that in, in mm. the, that report also. And parental involvement officers. The number has probably remained static, but the amount of time that they actually have to support parental involvement has been cut drastically. So, you know, there are already cuts going through at head office. In schools, we're seeing classroom assistants, language assistants, um, <coughs> business managers. You know, the, the non-teaching staff have already been cut. And parents are, are already saying that they are, they are seeing that... that for young people with, with additional needs, there is a reduced resource within schools. And that, that's already out there. That's already happening. Now, a lot of these kids won't appear on your attainment charts. So how do we know what impact that's having, other than the fact that parents are telling us, and I imagine that um, people at the Additional Support Needs Tribunal will be getting more cases? Can I just... Uh -huh. 
I'm heartened by that report, Riley, because I think we have raised the, the barrier in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And the big issue is, though, if the cuts that that we're talking about going to come in is it can only be detrimental to the, the system. It can't keep going. if Because the only way, as I say, to save serious money is school closures and staffing. And as soon as we start affecting the staffing, things are going to fall. Because there's that much pressure on the staff just now that they can only get worse. And that is my concern is we're so far with we're going through this period of curriculum for excellence and the new qualifications, the new hires all coming in. And if we start now taking, tightening, squeezing the grip, can we actually go where everybody around here probably you all were involved in the curriculum for excellence? Can we actually take it to where you've seen ten years ago where you were going to go with curriculum for excellence? Why how can we possibly stop that trend now? And my biggest worry is we buck that trend, that ten year trend for what we have been raising it. The, the issue is, is about attainment for all young people and, and youth work provides an opportunity for, for some young people where the formal school system isn't the best suit for them and that they can achieve in other ways and they can progress and develop their own skills and confidence and interests. And I suppose the challenge is that the, the school budgets are, are statutory, there's a set of statutory measures. Youth work doesn't have the same preserve and status in that way and we're really conscious that local authorities are having to make tough choices between fulfilling their statutory ob- obligations to provide school education but there's also the informal education sector of youth work and family learning which can create greater benefit for young people in the long run um, as a preventative spend measure. Um, I think um, something the committee could consider is that um, there is a massive you know differentiation between the amount of spending in constituencies um, and local authorities and it, it varies quite a lot and um, and what we're concerned about is we want to ensure that all young people in Scotland have the same level of high quality education and that you know everyone has access to these opportunities and I would agree with what um, Susan's saying that you know something that's really important to young people is they get additional opportunities so like we've been told that work experience is absolutely vital to you know their employability and things like um, providing different options for people's you know the system I think something that Curriculum for Excellence has done really well is realised the system um, can't be a one-size-fits-all system anymore and we need to continue to promote more vocational opportunities and you know um, different pathways to college um, and university um, so that all people's you know have an opportunity to take the pathway to employability that suits them. Thanks. Quick question to Louise before I bring in um, George Adam. You said that, um, and you're quite right of course, that the amount of money that's spent per pupil varies between local authorities. Um, you were criticising that, I, I'm assuming you were, that was a criticism. Um, what was your solution then to that? It wasn't such. A, it wasn't so much as a criticism. It was. It was more of just a, yeah, something that I noticed. And, um, you know, I think I don't dispute that. You know, there are factors that come into that, like rurality and stuff. But um, <clears throat> I think that we just need to make sure that you know, the consistency of education isn't differentiating between local authorities. And I'm. I'm not saying it does, but um, you know. The difference in spending is quite a lot. I mean, the lowest is 4,433 and the highest is 10,821. And, you know, that's that's a massive difference. And the amount of resources that could be bought in that money um, could could definitely have an impact on someone's education. But clearly, I mean, if you're, you're quite right that you point out this difference, but if you're pointing out the difference, you must have a, a destination in mind to resolve this issue. I mean, you're obviously raising it as an issue, as a problem. So, I mean, are you suggesting, for example, that the, the, there should be uh, a statutory minimum? You know, are you suggesting that there should be centralised budgets? Are you, I mean, what is it you're um, suggesting? I think, um, like, I, d- I don't have a solution. I'm not the best person to provide one. Mm. But I think that, you know, we need to maybe compare and contrast local authorities just to make sure that, you know, if something's working well in one local authority, then you know, that could be a good solution for another local authority. And if they're saving money on something that's working really well and having really good impact on their education, then that, that would be a good solution for another local authority. And it would maybe save them a bit of money or they could maybe see a situation where spending an extra little bit of money, you know, has 
uh, an impact and pr um, provides them with better quality education. Mm. So maybe just a bit of comparison between local authorities and um, seeing what they're getting for their money's worth. Okay. Thank you. Clearly, Ellen, and we want to get Eileen, sorry, yeah. you want to go in here. I mean, the, the local authorities have that control. They are, they are responsible for education budgets. They decide on the amount of money they spend uh, per pupil. Um, what's your view on that? Well, do you know, I'd like to know how it works. Um, when I when I started in this job, I tried to find out, and the, one of the people I spoke to, who shall, shall remain nameless, said to me, "It's only two people who know how it works, and one of them's deed." So, you know, there is a complete lack of transparency, and I just find that unacceptable. I just, you know, as a as a as a council taxpayer, as a parent, I want to know how education is funded. I want to see how much money my local authority gets. I want to see how the decisions are made around how that money is spent. And I fail to understand why there is such disparity between different local authorities. Yes, of course, there's going to be some difference, again, because of rurality or whatever, but that doesn't actually answer the question. When you look at the, the difference in the figures, it makes no sense to me. Um, and I, I just would like to, to see the figures and, and understand why they are as they are, because it, um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Can I, just, can I just come in on that? I think part of the thing is it's good management, and it's different authorities managing things differently. But I would actually be more radical and say we've got 32 authorities. Some of them are tiny. I think we need to box a bit clever, and they need to actually start sharing services here, and they need to start sharing education. I mean, to have we authorities right next door to each other, and they all to have a director, head of services, QIOs, does not make sense to me. When you've got like big authorities like Glasgow and Edinburgh, who have got one, who have got probably more than three or four of these schools together, and I think we need to start. The authorities need to start boxing a bit clever. I know it's very hard for yourselves because at the end of the day you give them the money, but you can't tell them what to do with their money. And I know that's a huge issue, but I think we need to try to say to them, look, you need to be a bit cleverer here. Can you work together? How can you start to share the services? And I know they've tried it in a couple, but I think we need to put a wee bit of pressure. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I know I said I'd bring in George, but we're kind of straight into I think, an area that Claire was interested in, so I'm going to swap the questions. We don't mind bringing Claire at this point. Um, Sorry. It, it, You've, you've just been discussing, and um, uh, the Scottish Government does provide the block grant to the local authorities to make the decision how they're going to spend it, um, and there are elements that are national bargaining, like teachers' wages, although the other support staff will be, be uh, appointed in local agreements. Um, but the Scottish Government did um, use an element of... Um, pressure in terms of um, teacher number ratios recently. I think that's come away in this budget. But in the past, they have used mechanisms to influence local authorities in certain areas. And I just wondered if you had um, a, an opinion about where the balance of power lies in terms of, of who's making the decisions and um, whether you think that the balance is right at the moment and, and what influence you can have um, with the decision makers, both at local and government level. Well, I mean, our submission, you know, we actually put forward the even more radical suggestion that we should have a, a real rethink about how we deliver education services. You know, again, picking up on what Ian said, we've got 32 local authorities, we've got an incredible amount of duplication. Um, is that the most efficient way for us to deliver education for the betterment of all of our young people? And that's a question I think we need to address. You know, I'm not, not saying it isn't, but I'm asking, is it? You know, I think we really do have to stop and think, is this the best way of ensuring that all of our young people get the best possible service? Um, and the, the duplication between local authorities is just one part of that. You know, there is, there is also this issue of transparency. There is, a, there is and again, we identified, identified in our submission the, the, the whole reality of what is happening at local authority level, that we no longer have education departments. I think we only have one education director left in Scotland. So we have children and families. We have leisure children and families. We have justice children and families. And the focus on education is being diminished. 
and the understanding of what we're aiming for, I believe, is being diminished. And that's, that's being, <laughs> being um, further enacted by the cuts that are going on and, the, and the, the reduction in staffing within local authorities. So I think there comes a point where we have to say, stop. You know, is this really the best way to do this? Um, and we would suggest that, that the time has come when we do that. Um, so I'll just pick up on that point. Um, you um, mentioned um, the question, how could we have influence in decision makers? Um, I think something we're very lucky and grateful to have um, in Scotland is that we've got lots of youth organisations like SYP. And, you know, we specialise in consulting with young people and, you know, we've got a, an MSYP um, in every single constituency in Scotland. And I think if you want to get young people's views, they're a brilliant way to do it. They're, they're interested, they specialise in co consultation with young people and they can deliver the views to you. And I think it's, it's very valuable and it would have very good outcomes because you're going to get you'll get a, an opinion straight from um, the young person's mouth, per se. Um, I think something else that's really important is we were absolutely delighted that um, you introduced a, cha a training youth and women's employment um, budget. And, you know, I think there's a valuable thing there that you can link the link the two together. Um, there's key links between education and employability. And... Um, you know, if you can maybe get them to work together a bit, it would provide, you know, very good links for the future because at the end of the day, it's the education that's going to go on to make them em 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 employable and um, young people get their employability school uh, skills from schools. So I think there's a, there's a very key link there that's very important and I think that the committee could consider doing um, something with that and it would be very valuable. Um, from our perspective, we would also welcome the involvement of young people um, in decision making or consultation activity around local decision making. And we know that um, within our membership, there are a network of local youth voice organisations um, who are quite often placed within the education departments um, of local authorities who could provide a vehicle for, for meaningful dialogue um, around spend. And, and we've seen around um, the referendum our young people engaging on a single issue topic and their ability to, to present solid argument and explore fact and be aware of, of consequences. And I think education is a similar issue um, because it affects young people on a day to day basis. And there would be no doubt um, there wouldn't be any shortage of ideas or creativity from young people as to how, how budgets could be allocated. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm painfully aware as we drifted into discussions of local authority reorganisation, I represent uh, the smallest local authority in Scotland, uh, which may be preserved by being surrounded by water, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, I, one of the benefits of, of devolution has been, as um, I, I think it was a Basque politician explained to me, that the bums are closer to kick. And is there, is there a sacrifice that we, are, that we make, that we're prepared to make, that while everything's going well, nobody necessarily needs to, to go in and, and, and face up either to their elected member or to their um, education official? But when that isn't the case, the notion that you're having shared services with, um, with with other authorities, which mean the individuals you feel you need to see are that bit further away, that bit more distant from you, um, becomes a problem. Um, so is there, a, is there a risk in quite understandably looking at where savings might be made that in a sense we, we dilute the, <laughs> the sort of democratic accountability of some of these individuals um, in pursuit of, of uh, of, of, of savings and actually what we do is we, we lose perhaps more than we gain I think if you look at the very large local authorities like Glasgow like Highlands or whatever I think you have to ask the parents there do they feel that they're close enough to the bums they need to kick mm. I, you know and I don't know the answer to that but I suspect a lot of them do um, and, and so the contrast there between some of the tiniest local authorities and some of the biggest you know actually I'm not sure if size is, is the issue here. Um, has it not got to do more with how local authorities and local politicians um, engage with their constituents? Um, I'm, I'm not offering a perspective on that, you know, a, a view, but I mean, I just think that, that you know, perhaps the, the, the key to it is more about the quality rather than the quantity. And if, I just think Sorry. if the quality is right, then it shouldn't matter if the head or the director of education or whatever you want to call them is sitting in one authority, they'll always have somebody in the other authority. And as long as they're working together, eh, 
then it shouldn't really matter. Yeah, as I say, when everything's working, nobody has yeah. a, a problem. But it's, when, it's all when down it's to not, leadership. Then it's, it's, it becomes it's, more problematic. Yeah. But it's all down to the leadership, and it's the exact mm. same as in schools. And that's why I said earlier that the management of authorities varies across the country, and it's the exact same scenarios of, of the leadership in the schools varies mm. across the country. And it's the exact same. If you get the right people in the right job, then it's totally different. And that's why you see the issues in schools where they're way above where people would normally think they should be, but it's down to leadership. It's interesting you make that point because what the, I was going to go on to ask was whether or not actually the way of addressing that potential democratic deficit is to have the accountability rested more within individual schools. I mean, what's striking is that you see differences across local authorities in terms of per head of pupils um, spending per head of pupil, uh, but actually there's 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 a there's an amazing amount of kind of uniformity ac across local authorities. Um, which kind of suggests that there's a bit of a one-size-fits-all within each local authority. Do you think there'd be advantages in, in, in having head teachers, heads of department, whoever it may be, um, perhaps um, empowered to, to take more decisions um, themselves in this kind of Well, that, that was the idea behind devolved school management. Mm. If, you, if you're old enough to remember, um, you know, and, and if, if you look at the... I can't remember the name of the report that David Cameron did around... Mm devolved school management and the potential there for developing leadership within schools. But, you know, we've got a real issue um, in terms of recruiting head teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, there is a real challenge there. Um, schools are, or local authorities are really struggling to get people to step up to take on leadership roles. Now, again, speak to the teaching unions and whatnot about that, but, it, you know, it seems to be a combination of factors. Um, and they'll say it's terms and conditions and so on. But it's not just that. You know, there are there are other factors um, at play here, and one of them is that actually, as a head teacher, you have very little control. You've got control of the paperclip budget. You know, mm. that's about the only bit of the budget you've got control of, because mm. all the rest is committed. You've got your your establishment costs, your power costs, your staff costs. That's all committed before you start, and you're left with, you know, as I say, the paperclip budget. So if you're go if you're actually going to have an effective leadership in a school, you actually have to give them a wee bit of authority. I'm going to reiterate my point and say I think you should get young people involved rather than head teachers. I think if, you know, I think head teachers probably worry that if they say the wrong thing then, you know, it might have an effect but I think young people will tell you exactly what they think and they'll tell you exactly what's right and what's wrong in schools and I can I can see a personal example so I've just left school I've just gone to my first year of university and um, they just had a review that they were probably going to shut my high school down and there was a massive backlash in the community um, and you know there's been huge protests and consultation and it was just a, a suggestion it wasn't even going ahead so I think if you if you ask people they'll tell you and um, all you can do is listen, and I think a, a very good way of doing this is, you know, consulting with young people. They'll tell you the quality of their schools, and they'll be honest about it. And um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. all I can say. I, I, I want to move on. Um, very specific. No, just just to add to that, the, the, the approach should be putting the child at the centre, and you know, that's what the Scottish Government have committed to. Um, and I think there's real opportunity to build locally from what children, young people need in their communities and for their learning, um, both individually and collectively. Great, thank you. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, convener, uh, and I'm glad to get in before everybody answers all my questions beforehand. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'd like to talk about the solutions to, and I take it personal, uh, convener, uh, uh, the solutions to the budgetary challenges that we have, and uh, in a number of the th uh, things that you have submitted already, I think it was the National Parent Forum of Scotland, say that local authority strategies for engaging in parents in these discussions, budget discussions, are not always effective. Budget discussions presume a high level of understanding. Many parents feel they lack the expertise and or time to contribute to financial debates of this nature. Now, as a former councillor, I would probably agree with that because I've been in the, an administration whose bum was kicked on a no, numerous occasions by various uh, parent, parental groups, and it was mainly because of the lack of communication discussion. Now, my question would be, how do we manage to actually change that? Because I think that's a starting block at a local authority level. You know, how do we sit there at the early on in the budget's level, you know, and say, this is the challenge we face, 
how do we work together to try and make sure we can make uh, attain what we want to do? Because it's not just a case of you've all agreed and your submissions of just flinging money at uh, situations. It can be targeting. And also with young people, uh, you know, as a, there's a scope for them as well because I've got a constituent who wanted to do an advanced higher in modern studies only found out two weeks before he went back to school that he wasn't going to be given that opportunity. So there's an opportunity for young people as well. So how... How would you see as a very basic solution at that stage to be open and transparent? Do local authorities get that opportunity to sit down and talk to you? Can, can I just, can I, I'll come in on that first. I, I totally agree with you. It's uh, And I think the key word is early enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, the authorities all know next year is going to be hard. Why are they not having parents' meetings just now actually telling them? And not just telling them, but it's telling them that it's going to be hard, but saying, have you got any ideas? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's getting into that discussion and making parents aware of the, the actual situation we're going to be in and I think that to me is the key factor normally what happens is you're probably well aware of they'll come to you pre the budget discussion to say here's the, here's the proposed cuts and out of that you know some that are never going to be acceptable because councillors would never do it because the election's just round the corner and it's, it's their bum in the seat that's going uh, so out of the proportions they give you, there's only two or three that you would actually say we can go with. So I think it's getting into the early dialogue. And I, I need to say, parents need to be up front as well and realise the problems that the country's going through just now and education as well. And they need to be up front and saying, there are issues, what can we do and try to support that? Now, as for your, some of the things that they can do, like you say, your constituent couldn't do the, the advanced hire. In this day and age with technology, Highland are already doing it, but they're teaching from one place to another bit of the, the country through a, the internet and stuff. Why can't somebody in Glasgow tap into that system? They're already doing it. Why can't somebody in Dumfries tap into Shetland, vice versa? In that way, we could probably offer every subject under the sun if we started being a wee bit clever. If, if some authorities are already doing it, open it up. Right, there might be a small charge, but at least you'll start actually giving and get you'll actually start getting it right for every child instead of just talking about getting it right for every child. And I think to me that is an, a, an easy one to where we can actually offer the whole curriculum across the country. Part of your problem though is, is the broadband one, which is another issue, mm -hmm. but that's a, a solution I would see. But get into conversations very early with your parents and be upfront with them. And I think that's a key factor be upfront. I mean, I would, I would agree with, with that. Um, I do think there is a patriarchal kind of approach and, and dare I say, a patronising approach around topics like budgeting and so mm -hmm. on. You don't need to understand this. You know, this is really complicated. Well, try me, you know, explain it to me. Um, and, you know, I come from a communications background and, and, and the truth is you don't wait until there's a crisis to start talking. You talk early and you get people on side early. And actually, parents need to be part of the decision-making process about the design of their service, not simply given a menu, right? These are, these are, these are what we're looking at. Choose which ones you, you think we can give the chop to. So, you know, I think there are, there are some really fundamental issues about the way that local authorities, um, and dare I say government, deals with the public and shares information and the transparency of information and the accessibility of information. Um, but, you know, nothing beats talking to people. Um, and, and if you get to budget time and you haven't started talking to people yet, that's when you run into trouble. And parents, you know, will get, um, you, you know, more and more angry um, at the way in which, the direction in which things are going in their local authorities. Um, I can offer a bit of personal insight to this. So, um, at my school, I had I had very good opportunities. If I wanted to do a subject, they would bend over backwards to let me do it, and I had a very good quality of education. But I know that this 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 isn't consistent through all schools. Just from personal experience, it varies quite a lot in my local authority. Um, but I think like systems like that worked well. For example, in my school, if they didn't offer a subject, they would um, help. Um, provide you to go to another school that could offer the subject in the local authority and you know they'd help a bit with transport if that was an issue um, and I think you know methods that work very well for some schools 
could potentially work very well for other schools and like I was saying before I think this this opportunity for you know different local authorities within local authorities and between different local authorities it's it's going to be good to have a discussion about systems that work well and I think this is something the committee could consider that you know there needs to be that space for schools to tell them what's tell them tell each other what's going well and what's not going well so that they can build on each other's experiences. Thank you, Susan. Um, I would just like to, to sort of say that you know, local authorities have gone through significant changes and we, we're aware of that and the young people are feeling that in how their school day is organised, the number of subjects they're studying in a day, the structure of their school week. Um, but in terms of communication, you know, the youth work sector has an offer to make um, to education authorities and, and to young people and about coordinating that amount of time because young people don't spend their whole week in school. It's a proportion of that and making sure that there are meaningful offers that develop young people's learning and their personal development beyond the school gates. Um, and we believe that youth work can be part of that solution. Where do we go with uh, looking at the education budget locally at various local authorities? I, by the way, I agree with uh, Eileen when she uh, says that you know we should talk a lot qu quicker, get you involved, be involved in the process of budgetary because we always seem to get to the burning torch stage with uh, uh, with the parents before they actually anything happens in the local authority. But one thing I would actually say is, well, we've talked about the budget, the fact that 51 percent of the budget's on uh, salaries, 18.65% uh, on other employees, and 11% on uh, premises and related costs. Now, where do we go? Where, where, where do we look? How do we address the challenges that we're looking at here? Or local authorities, where do they go when they're looking at these challenges? Because the holy grail, as is already quietly in local authority terms, is joint working is uh, finding ways, but in Renfrewshire, where I come from, it's been talked about for 10, 15 years, and we're no further forward, working with Glasgow City Council next door, Inverclyde, you know, the, all the local authorities. But uh, where do we go? I know Clack Manager, I think, have got a... They work with Stirling uh, uh, over a kind of joint period. Uh, you know, where do we go? There's also, I know there's something like £348 million spent a year on PPP contracts. That's about money we could actually do with uh, at this stage, you know, but... Where would you say, uh, if we were sitting down at your local authority and saying we're at the budget start of the budget process, where would you suggest to local authorities we should go down? Can I have a relatively short answer? I'm worried about time. We've still got a lot of areas to go through. We'll start with Susan this time. We'd um, be looking at what, what measures can take for preventative spend, so looking long term around what impacts can and interventions can we do now that will make a benefit in the longer term. And in terms of, of premises and PPI, a lot of community groups and within authorities are having to pay charges to use facilities that were previously there. And although we see within the, the budget the investment in capital bill, we want to make sure that, that community groups are not penalised for delivering their activities because they're now having to pay charges into to schools. I would agree with Susan that um, preventative spending is a very good idea. So maybe the committee could consider, you know, fixing the little the little issues that there are with curriculum for excellence and the implementation. So you know that's gonna if you if we fix that now, that'll run into the into the long run. Um, also, um, making sure that we set up these links with um, the. Uh, training in youth and women's employability uh, budget, um, because I think that it's vital that you know we do make this link between um, education and employability, and um, you know keep continue to offer vocational options to young people and options to do extracurricular activities like volunteering. Um, I think it's very uh, valuable to their future um, and their employability. So. Thank you. I wish I had the answer to your question. I think, you know, we've been doing what we, we've called salami slicing for, for a number of years now. Um, and, you know, as, as we said in our paper, um, we actually think that the time has come to take a radical rethink, to step back and say, is local authority delivery of education the best way that we can do this? Um, because I'm just not sure that there's enough flex um, left within local authorities to really maintain the investment that we need in our, in our schools and in our young people um, to get where we want to go. 
Um, as, as, as Ian pointed out earlier, we're in real danger of actually taking a downward dip, um, and that's not where we want to go. I mean, I'll do my usual. I've got a few radical, which you'll probably not like, but such is life. The shared services, I think we need to definitely, and I probably think that's the best one to probably get down just now. Uh, the future trust, we're putting all this money into the old, into the brand new schools. Can is there some way we can actually use the future trust money to get rid of some of these PPI and PPF or whatever you want to call them contracts and the authorities? Can some of that money be moved so we can alleviate some of the pressures? I know we, in my authority, we are paying something like five hundred million pounds over thirty years for four schools. That's bonkers. I mean, who would buy a house for that? Take a price of that payback. The uh, probably my next ones will be about what Ireland says. Is thirty two the best way forward? We seem to be rationalised everything else across the country, police Scotland. So I would suggest, do we go down to Scottish education? And do we do away with 32 authority educations? Do we take it off their hands completely? That's my radical one. OK. You didn't disappoint, Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To Colin. Thank you, Vera. <coughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, I see there's been one or two radical... Uh, solutions put forward. Uh, one is the centralisation of the budget or ring fencing of it, and the other, of course, is increasing taxes, which is never a popular one. But is there actually space for getting better value for money from the education bu budget? Is there, an, is there actually enough money in there, but is it being spent in the wrong places or the wrong priorities? Can we do better? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, can always do, we can always, always do better. Do better. Mm -hmm. Always do better. Uh, yes, I think it's. I mean, I'll go back to my author my authority. We've got things thirty four, thirty five primary schools in the size of Western Barton. Bonkers, absolutely bonkers. But it's down to the local councils to make that decision. Will they actually close schools? My heart says we can't close a school. But when you get schools in each other's doorstep, I think the the heads got to come in and say. What we're going through just now, we, we really need to be a wee bit more radical thinking. Uh, so I think we need to be, we need to think cleverer. As I say, to me, it's all down to management. How can one authority be really good at it and another authority not be good at it? I, I hate saying the word sh share good practices because I don't think it's a, it's a good saying. Because normally what happens is if, if you say, say to somebody, go and look at that good practice, the first thing they go is, we're never going to reach that. We're not even going to look at it. So I think we, we need to box a bit clever. I said my radical solution is they need to share services. And we need to just box a bit clever. Uh, and we need to make sure we've got the right people in the right jobs. And that, that's from head teachers to teachers all the way through. best value is about looking at early and effective intervention um, and again we think that youth work can, can offer that in terms of um, raising attainment, uh, um, achievement, progression but also um, school attendance for, for young people where um, formal education is a, is a struggle and a challenge and it's not the best suit for them um, and making sure that, that school leaders are not um, drawn into using their time for the most vulnerable and actually allowing youth work to, to do that role and work in partnership effectively. I think community engagement is something, you know, it's a bit of a buzz out there just now. Um, and it's, it's, we've been very poor, really, at engaging communities. And, and, you know, I know that we get a lot of calls from parents who are very distressed because, you know, their local authorities looking at closing their school or their school's under threat or whatever. Um, and on a personal level, you can completely identify. But as Ian says, if you've got two small primary schools, cheap by jowl, um, and both of those schools have been maintained, all of that property is having to be maintained, et cetera, et cetera. You know, th this, this, is, this is not a victimless crime because, you know, what we'll say to parents is, if you think about the amount of money that's been spent, you know, that is sitting on the head of each child in those two schools, if you combine them, think how much more money would sit on the head of each one of those children because maintaining that school, maintaining that building and all that goes on around it um, is not efficient. And you can't blame local authorities or any authority for saying, actually, we have to be a whole lot more efficient with the way that we deliver our service. So while on a personal level, yes, it's painful, 
we, we, we do have to really be a wee bit more calculating in how we deal with these issues. So I, I don't want to cut anybody off, but we have to really speed up a little bit. You know, I'm going to come back to Colin now. Well, so just, one, just one question on the back of that. If we accept the, the proposition that more money is required, where do we get it from? That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all our problems. Well, I agree about the bottom line. Well, we've, we've not got the post strings. Uh, and it's just, you're probably fully aware, it's just not sustainable the way we're going. And we were talking earlier about what cuts are there. If you look at the ASN thing, there's huge cuts already happening in the ASN, which I think these kids are our most vulnerable people in school. And to actually be cutting them because it's seen as an easy cut, and that's what it's seen as an easy cut. Kids that had a full one to one support last year are now down to like five hours this year. I don't think that should be allowed. And I, I'm going to use the, the word that you don't like. I think things like that need to be ring fenced. There's certain bits of the school, I agree we shouldn't be ring fencing a lot of things, but I think ESN is scandalous when we start affecting these children and taking out hours that these kids need. Yeah. And, and, you know, can I just add to that? And, and the impact of that will be that um, more children will be excluded. We already know that children who have additional needs are much more likely to be excluded than their typical peers. So more children will be excluded and teachers will struggle to manage behaviour in a class where, where children are unsupported. So, you know, it completely backfires and it impacts on everyone, impacts on other pupils and it impacts on the school as a whole. Okay. You are aware that the number of ASN staff has, has gone up by 8%. Well, I know from, from the head teacher at my son's school that they're looking at a reduction in the number of additional support needs. Over, year on year. Overall, overall, the number of staff in the ASN has gone up by 8%. Well, yes, well, they're I, looking at reductions over the next few years. I would that's, like, that's I'd like to see told. where these places are because all the places I'm hearing, there's, it's cuts here, cuts there. They're taking ASN auxiliaries away. These, these are the figures. The overall figures are up by 8%. It's well, increased in primary schools. It has gone down in secondary schools. Well, all the evidence I'm getting is... I don't know where you're getting the figures from, but it's not well, evidence. The figures are coming from no. the actual number of staff employed by local authorities. Yeah, but, well, from parents, that's not the feeling. That's not the feedback we're getting back from parents. Okay, uh, but I'm just pointing out the the, the facts. But the number, the overall yeah. numbers have. I mean, I accept what you're saying, but the numbers don't don't reflect mm -hmm. that at the moment. I've, I, I want to move on because we've got three people still to come in. Um, I'm going to take Liam, and then uh, Neil, and then Jane. Uh, thank you. Can I, can I also start by apologising for my late arrival early on due to uh, flight delays? Uh, can I take you on to the national performance uh, framework? We've had uh, a bit of a mixed bag by way of um, feedback in, in, in terms of the usefulness um, of the, the, the MPF in, in moving us towards a kind of outcomes-based policy in, in, in relation to, uh, to schools and, and education. The unions seem to be slightly critical of it being, I think one called it a blunt instrument. Children in Scotland, I think, are more positive about it, but Sort of reflect that it may wish to, to look at other indicators if it's to, to help in terms of uh, budgeting. Um, I just wonder whether anyone on the panel has particular views about the national performance framework, whether it does work. Um, even if it does, are, are there things that we should be picking up uh, that might make it uh, more effective? I think children in Scotland point to both attainment but, but inequality uh, as well, which uh, perhaps isn't as reflected as well as it might. The youth work sector, the national performance framework, is, is seen as, uh, as a part of a suite of indicators and outcomes um, for the sector. And um, YouthLink is currently supporting um, our membership to look at outcomes for youth work that fit and feed into the national performance framework. So um, we would welcome the, the maintaining of, of that structure. Are there things that it's not picking up that you're do I mean you were talking before about the kind of value added that you provide, particularly for those who, for, for whom a, a school setting isn't necessarily always the, 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 the most comfortable, most appropriate. Yeah, and I think that comes into the, the unique nature and purpose of youth work. And I think using our, our statement on the on the nature and purpose of youth work helps us um, identify some of those challenges about widening worldview and, and really starting with where the young person is at. Um, but the overall outcome, um, you know, national outcome four, there, there, that that works for us in terms of um, what we want every child or young person in Scotland to be. At SYP we have an e-learning programme which um, kind of ties in with that and I know at Young Scott they're, they're working on a modern apprenticeship programme um, and I went to an award ceremony for that last week and they'd all they'd all, all the people who'd gone into these modern apprentices had further employability and they had gone on to um, jobs which they were interested in doing or further apprenticeships which they wanted to do so I think like prog programmes that 
youth work provide are very valuable um, and especially for you know um, you know furthering employability skills I mean it, it's gonna look it's very difficult it's we're in tough times at the minute and it's very difficult to get into things like university and I think having these opportunities is very valuable um, as it furthers these um, opportunities for young people I really, you know, I, we, we haven't really addressed the national performance framework. I think for, for most parents, it's a complete unknown. I mean, what is it? How does it work? You know, they don't... They, it's not information that, that is shared with them at local authority or at school level. Um, they're not aware of what it means or how it impacts on how services are delivered. And, you know, it takes us back to the discussion that we had with Mr Adams, Adams around, you know, how transparent is the system? Well, the answer is not... Okay. I, would, I was going to ask whether we should have a measurement, a, a, a clearer measurement in relation to the progress being made in supporting those with additional support needs. But I think given the earlier confusion about actually how many additional support <laughs> needs um, uh, workers are, are, are actually in the field, um, it would suggest that there are, there are other issues there that uh, perhaps need uh, addressing more, uh, more urgently. I think for your national performance, <coughs> most parents... To be honest, I don't think I actually bothered about the national performance. They're more interested in what's happening in their school, mm. and so. But do they see that on the basis of inputs, so that the budget's gone up, <coughs> the teachers have remained the same or have, uh, or have increased, <laughs> that the subject choices are as wide as they were the previous year, or are the uh, are, are they looking at kind of trends over the course of? A number of years and saying that we're, we're progressing in this area but we're not progressing in, in that area because essentially that's I suppose what the national frame, performance framework is looking to achieve on a, on a, on a wider scale. Again I, I think parents first and foremost are only interested in their own child and how well they're doing and so they, what they want to do is compare what's happening in their school in the school down the road which I don't understand and I don't even understand why they would want to look at what's happening nationally because Matt, are you going to move your child because the school down the road is doing better the school in a different authority is doing better and I don't think they will so all their interest in what's happening at their school how is their staff working is this have they got the staff which is the big issue they, is it supply staff is it can they get the supply staff and that's what they're they're more interested in. they're not really interested my my feeling I get from parents is when they have these meetings they don't really want to know What's happening nationally? It's locally and from local down to their school. Okay, thank you. Um, Neil? Firstly, can I thank you for your evidence this morning? It's certainly given us a, a reality check in terms of what's happening on the ground and should act as a, as a, as a wake-up call to um, the Scottish Government. Um, can I ask, we've talked a lot about consultation with, with local authorities. Can I ask you about consultation with the Scottish Government? The first sentence of the uh, draft budget document says sets out the Scottish Government spending plans and goes on to say for consultation with the people of Scotland. Now, obviously, the budget doesn't set individual school budgets, but there are implementations for the for the uh, local government block grant, and also there are decisions, national policies around teacher numbers, etc. Can I ask you what, uh, to what extent, your organisations have been involved uh, in discussions around spending on schools with? the Scottish Government, either prior to or subsequent to the publication of the draft budget? That's easy. Not, not at all. Hey, I'm sitting on the working group that hey, Mr Swinney put for teachers' terms and conditions wants to report back by the 1st of March. I've sat, I sat in quite a normal, quite a few committees sitting in the Crown Fraser Management Board and, and a few of my other hey, colleagues sitting in other big committees like Giffrey, hey, the Wood Commission. The Adler the Year's Collaborative, so we're, we're feeding in to these. And the other organisations have... Um, I'm, I'm aware of, however, I've only been with the organisation a, a short period of time. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure our team can get back to you on that. OK. Um, and my follow-up question to that is, in what ways do you think that, given what I said earlier about the, the, the budget and the implications for, for, um, for spending on schools, how do you think consultation with the Scottish Government could be improved with organisations representing pupils and parents throughout the draft budget process and what would you say to the Scottish Government at the moment in terms of um, 
uh, this, this this draft budget and the implications that that has given everything that we've been hearing about um, the pressure the budget pressures are having on classrooms and on, on, on pupils. I, I would say that that um, you know at the end of the day the parents on behalf of their children are, are at the sharp end. Um, and and they are the people who can give, as was said earlier, they can give a reality check as to what it feels like on a day-to-day -day basis in our schools, whether it's things like parents having to contribute to materials costs or their children avoiding school trips or activities because it's going to cost them money, their experience of additional support needs or language assistance not being available or subjects not being available. So they're, they're the folk that can actually... We, we don't we don't talk in a kind of, kind of policy speak. We talk about what's actually happening to our kids in our schools in our local communities. So um, to me, that should be gold dust. You know, that should be the, the 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 kind of starting point for what's it actually looking like. Because we can talk at policy level about this plot grant and and that ring fencing and whatever, but actually, what matters to our young people? for their future is what's happening in their local school, in their classroom, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, that discussion has to start there. Um, and, and we made a point in the submission that actually this, the budget is largely inaccessible. You know, that's, that is not going to get through to your average parent. That information is, is, is opaque and, and simply isn't understandable to most people. I know, because I struggled. I would I'd go along with what Eileen's saying. Uh, but the interesting it will be the next three years. We've got a general election, we've got a Scottish election, we've got a local election. And uh, what surprises me, every time elections come along, pots of money seem to become available. Uh, and I hate to say it, pol politicians are going for a short-term hit. And maybe we need to look at stop the short-term hits. And that means the curriculum as well. Let's stop doing things that so ministers or directors of education or local councillors. It's amazing how local councillors can find a wee pet project and find money for it, yet we can't find money to put into sustainable. And I think we need to look at box a wee bit clever and stop trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. But as for the, how can parents get fully involved in the budget? As Eileen says, you look at it and you, you can't understand it. You, you need to have a maths degree and even then you'll be struggling. Okay, thank you. The, the views of young people and children themselves um, shouldn't just be replaced by parents. I think they have to happen in parallel um, to give, you know, young people are the experts in, in their own lives. They are the children who are in our schools today as, as we are discussing this. Um, and I think that, that working with national organisations such as ourselves and Young Scott and Scottish Youth Parliament um, through facilitated dialogue would start to unpack some of these issues for young people and with young people and, and we would welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Setting up um, uh, forums with young people and forums with parents, if you think that's going to be helpful as well. But we we would completely encourage at SYP that you get in touch with the young people in your local authorities and nationally and hold events where they can, you know, broadcast their views. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Jane Baxter, to finish That's convenient. Um, just thinking about um, moving from consultation to engagement because I think there's a... a a serious question about about what both those things mean. Um, I'm wondering if you if you have got any views or can give us any examples of how local authorities can en engage more appropriately with communities, especially in the light of what we've heard this morning about school as part of the community, the learning that goes on outside of school. Do you think this work should be developed more locally, and, and who should have an input locally, and who should lead on that locally? And I'm thinking in particular of of the deprived communities where parents might have not had such a good experience of school or where time pressures might be greater for some parents. What can the local authorities do to, to promote those approaches? Yeah, I think there, there's a role with, with youth work and its wider partners in community learning and development for, for family learning approaches um, that are really tailored and specific to the needs of, of the communities in which they, they sit. Um, there's examples of, of taking like a commission approach where um, communities are bringing their own evidence forward. So starting with a, a blank page rather than a pre-written page by any agency or um, to, to, to consult. Um, and I think that that level of transparency and openness and it being genuine 
is is what people welcome and and young people in particular are quite quick to distrust where they think there's an, an alternative agenda um, so making sure that, that those um, opportunities are, are equal and and based on trust and respect um, so we take examples even nationally things like the young Scots Youth Commission on alcohol and their youth commission on tobacco um, shows the approach where young people can actually generate solutions and recommendations to yourselves as um, you know in the Parliament and government um, as to to what the, some of the solutions and ideas may be and maybe there's scope to do this for education and, and bringing the, the depth of experience and range of experience that young people have across Scotland as Louise has, has identified you know depending on what school you go to you will have a different experience of education and we need to make sure that there's opportunities to hear all those voices and also the voices of young people where formal education hasn't been the best route for them. I would just add on to that that youth councils and youth forums are very valuable tools um, and I think that you know, when you're getting that engagement, we need to be very, very careful that we don't just target the ideal pupil and that we need to have discussions with pupils from all kind of forms of education, you know, people who are leaving school in fourth year to go off to college and people who are involved more in vocational education and people who are, you know, getting the top attainment and, you know, getting all the hires and going on to university. And we need to consider all the spectrum and make sure that all of them are getting their opportunity to have a say on the matters. No, I, I would I would agree with with a lot of what's been said. I think that you know really it has to be at community level. Um, you know, it, many years ago communities had their churches and they had their schools, and now actually they've got their schools for the most part if they're lucky. Um, so I think a lot of this can start in schools, um, and a lot of the discussion with young people. And, and with their parents, um, and it's got to be grounded in their lived experience, not um, set as an agenda from local authority or from central, central government. It's got to be about what their lives are now. Yeah, probably the only chance for engagement is through the school, because that's the only way you'll get it. Is I mean, we've probably all been at events where you, you, you hold an event for people and they'll only come, A, if they're wanting to. And it's the the harder ones that you want to, act, it's the ones you actually want to engage with and you can never engage with. Mm -hmm. And this happens right across the country. You can go into any school and they'll tell you the parents that they actually want to see is the parents that they never see. And the only way of probably getting around that is to go through the schools and especially use the youngsters in the schools because they'll bring their parents, their parents will come to see them, the parents will bring their friends, their grandparents, and to me that's the only way you'll get a proper engagement. Just one more convener. Just briefly, yes, please. Um, and just lastly, I wonder whether, whether any of the witnesses would keep, wish, to, wish to comment on the statement made by the Association of Directors of Education that due to sensitivities involved, and I'm quoting, the reality is that draft budgets are now kept largely confidential. There's been some reference to that already this morning, but that was a statement that they made. Does anybody want to comment on that? Is there a, an, an alternative process going on behind closed doors? That, that, that it's because they're seeing? all feared, <laughs> basically, isn't it? Um, and because at local authority level we're on election cycles and local politicians have their eyes constantly on are they going to get in next time round? So, so, you know, that's why I think a lot of the time um, budgets are kept close to the chest until, as you, you know, the lighted torch time. Um, and then actually you see it time and time again, um, local authority councillors backing off from making the tough choices, from making the tough decisions. And, you, you, you know, Western Bartonshire, we've seen it. Other local authorities, we've seen it as well because they're looking at when's their election coming up. It is quite, it's quite interesting. Uh, again, I'm going back to Western Barton. It's we changed the politicians lately. A different party took control, and the party previously were very upfront and showing you budgets. The budgets were in December. You seen them? They weren't obviously finalised until February, March. Now they appear in March, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's actually taken to me what was a big step forward is now taking a big step back. And it is. It's you hear things. Your director will tell you things that they probably shouldn't tell you. And this is happening across the country. So they're, they're trying to be up front, but their hands are fairly tied by politicians. And, and bear in mind, the people who are hearing that are the folk 
who are on their local representative group. It's not every parent, it certainly isn't. It's the, it's, it's the few that sit on groups or committees or whatever. So this message is not getting out to parents whose kids are, are in, in the schools. I think we've got an absolute duty to make sure that this information isn't confidential. People can't tell you what's you know what's good and what's bad if you know if it, until if if they don't know that it's going to be cut. I mean, um, it, the backlash will be when people find out the services are being cut, and I think that's when it, it'll become clear what services really matter in the local communities. Um, and like I say, it's 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 vital that we make we don't keep this information confidential because young people are going through that system and have to disagree that you know schools the only way to engage with them. I think from from my experience through SYP and through my local youth council, there are people who um, are struggling in the system who are readily available to to tell them to tell anyone their opinions on education and how they think improvements could be made. But we need to make that information available to them on what's going to be cut because if something valuable is going to get cut and they don't know about it, mm -hmm. it'll just go and there'll be no there'll be no conversation about it. Okay, thank you. Susan, you want to add? No. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, can I thank you all for coming along this morning? You've obviously raised a number of uh, very useful and, and important and interesting uh, matters that I'm sure uh, members will be interested to raise with the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary when he comes to committee next week. So thank you very much for coming along and I'll briefly suspend.
Uh, can I welcome our second panel of witnesses uh, this morning? We have Larry Flanagan from the Educational Institute of Scotland, uh, Jane Peckham from the National Association of Schoolmasters Union of Women Teachers, Jim Poulis from the School Leaders of Scotland, and Fiona Dale from the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association. So thank you to you all for coming along, and also thank you very much for your um, uh, written evidence which you've sent in in advance. That's been very helpful. Um, again, I'm going to start with the second panel of witnesses with Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I wonder if I can just uh, ask an opening question uh, around the type of budgetary pressures that you feel are having the greatest impact on pupils' education. And given that our first session ran over quite a bit, I wonder if you could also, in your uh, response, uh, advise us whether you think that primary school budgets uh, are keeping on track with the increase in pupil numbers and uh, a word about additional support needs because although staff have gone up by about 7 or 8 per cent, I've actually seen figures to say that uh, the projected increase in additional support, I think it was over 70 per cent. So if, if you wouldn't mind, just a general question, but if you could relate it to primary school budgets uh, increasing in line with pupil numbers and uh, given that uh, there are more pupils with additional support needs, is that being addressed? Thank you. I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I mean, the, the single largest item of expenditure in terms of school budgets relates to school staffing. So the you know if you're looking at where the where the pressure is, then it, it relates to uh, teacher numbers, uh, support staff numbers, uh, and, and admin support in terms of schools. Um, and I think that is where the the greatest pressure is. Um, it's it's clear from the evidence that if you look at primary schools, staff numbers are not increasing in line with the increases in terms of uh, uh, pupil increase. In secondary schools, um, again, if you look at the evidence we've provided, the, there's been a significant drop in the number of secondary teachers employed um, over the last five years. The last three years we've had a, an agreement um, since 2011 around maintaining pupil staff ratios. But in actual fact, the percentage of pupils, um, the drop in the, in the number of pupils at secondary school is less than the percentage of the number of teaching staff. Now, what that what that does is it creates a pressure towards bigger class sizes. It creates a pressure towards rationalisation of timetable choices. Um, it creates a kind of workload pressure that I alluded to the last time I spoke here in terms of the uh, the national four, national five qualifications. Um, and that becomes intense to the point where uh, you know our teacher will be survey indicated that uh, nearly 70 percent of teachers indicate that they're stressed all the time now the reason that's important beyond concern about the teachers themselves is that that is the the learning environment of young people so the I mean, if we understand the budgetary pressures that are on but the idea that cutting education budgets doesn't impact upon the service being delivered is just fanciful because, you know, in a whole range of ways, it does impact. And, and, and the last point I'll make, Convener, is particularly in relation to additional support needs. Um, because I was quite interested, I caught the tail end of the last session uh, in a discussion around pupil support assistance. It's just undoubtedly the case that uh, over the last few years, not, not simply uh, the last three years, that one of the issues that has been central to pressure in schools has been the policy of mainstreaming pupils with additional uh, support needs, uh, particularly pupils with emotional and behavioural difficulties. Uh, and we have a very strong feeling from our members that whilst we support that presumption of mainstreaming, um, it has to be resourced properly, and it's not been. Um, and, and even if there is a, a marginal increase in terms of secondary schools, in terms of primary schools, in terms of additional support, it does not match the need that is actually there. I, I spoke at a workload campaign meeting in Glasgow a fortnight ago, and one of the teachers got up and said she'd been an EIS member for over 20 years, and it's the first time she's come to a meeting. And the reason she was coming was because the start, since the start of term in her school, 
she had found three members of staff in tears. And these were members of staff who are capable, capable teachers. And the reason for it has been the inclusion, and these are infant classes, uh, of pupils who previously would have been in a special needs school, who have been put into the, these classes, and the teachers can't cope with the, the, the disruption that has been caused. Now, I think that's a, an issue for the, those individual pupils, and it's also an, in, uh, an issue for the rest of the class. And that, you know, we haven't got time to develop it, but that is a result of the budget pressures, because special needs schools are expensive, they're labour intensive. Uh, and if you mainstream kids, you get a cost saving, uh, but you're not providing the best education possible. So, you know, these, these cuts are hurting, particularly in relation to additional support needs. Uh, thank you. I actually uh, echo much of what Larry said. In, in reverse, I'll start with the additional support needs. It's, it's not a question of whether the budget's increased. It's how it's distributed when it's then implemented, and that's what's causing the difficulty, because uh, different areas are using different strategies to manage the budget that they have. And although there are support staff provided for particularly working with children with additional support needs. They're very often diverted to other roles and duties uh, within the school or within that area. I mean, another example of that is the cut in um, qualified teachers in the nursery and the um, attempt to cover the very laudable aim of, you know, of 600 uh, hours for children, and no one would disagree with that. The difficulty is that they're not employing enough uh, teachers to cover that and it doesn't fit with the teachers contractual week so um, our uh, members are reporting that uh, support staff who are employed to work with them to support the ASN children in their classrooms are being diverted to cover the spaces and the gaps in the nursery so the budget isn't affected in terms of the number of people employed but the effect is actually on what they're then tasked to do. And the difficulty, I think, although support staff are not in our membership, is that they very often aren't able to say, actually, no, that's not what my, my role is, um, and I, I see a need, therefore I'll go and I'll help out and all the rest of it. And I think it, it has to be recognised that still throughout uh, a lot of the documents they talk about efficiency savings. I mean, there are none now. There are no more to be made. Everything now is a cut. And that has to be recognised. Um, and I think that, that uh, transparency and openness is, is required. I was concerned to hear at the last session there about some kind of uh, uh, inability to share budgeting uh, openly, and that would, that would cause us great concern. Um, I think the pressures are huge. It's recognised that there is a finite amount of mon money to work with, but I think there has to be a lot more done in looking at the best use of of that money. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would not disagree with it, any of the points which are made either in the papers, the submissions from my, the colleagues to my left here and what they have said. But I would like to come at the, from a, a perhaps a slightly different angle, bearing in mind the, the, my represent, the, the organisation I represent. First thing to say, in, in answer to your question, a very general answer to your question, and one of the young people picked up the last time here, is that the experience in education of young people across Scotland will be dependent very much on where you are and which part of the country you are in. And we as an organisation for some time now have been hammering on at this in inequality of funding across the, the, the country. Now, if you we have got no great concern with the removal of ring fencing or funding, and if you're going to look at uh, and the opportunity of flexibility of approach across the country to meet needs across the, co the, the country, yes, that is a laudable aim. But it's a laudable aim which is perhaps sustainable during a time when there are not budget cuts. Now, when you start to look at budget cuts and you start to look at ring fencing and money, ring fencing and money, whatever else it did do, gave a certain importance to the things that the money was ring fenced for. If you look towards flexibility of approach, then everything is there to be cut. And coming back to your question on um, support staff and non-teaching support staff within school, it is to an extent an easy hit, and we are all suffering from that. Other aspects of this are related very much to the capacity of leadership across the country. Now, that's not just within schools, but within local authorities. 
If you then say there is a budget there, it's an entire budget which the, the chief executive of the local authority will then look at, then the cuts can be made indiscriminately. And the cuts within education, within educational leadership, are now starting to have a direct impact on the quality of experience within the classroom. It chimes exactly with what Larry Flanagan said in terms of workload, workload pressure and stress. Now, if you look at Scottish education just now, and forgive me for giving you a lecture, the, the, the three great pillars of Scottish education, I've got to say, are coming together well. We now have, are we getting towards having a curriculum there, which is a curriculum designed to meet the, the needs of young people across Scotland in their local environments. Teachers, teachers across Scotland have laboured long and laboured hard to put that in place. Now, we are now moving into a stage where Get It Right for Every Child and the Children and Young People Act and the implications of that within schools are going to start to bear upon staff and have an implication in terms of workload and in terms of what staff are doing. Now, if that implication means that the young people who are supposed to be supported through Get It Right for Every Child and through the Children and Young People Act are not going to be supported because you're removing the leadership and the management capacity, then you know the, the, you don't need me to tell you the, 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 the pressures that are going to come within that. If we then start to see the profession is looking at professional update, I will be involved in professional, is involved in professional update, and the way in which we re, re-professionalise Scottish teaching, the pressures which come on there, again, if we do not have a capacity to say, within the local authority, within the school, this is the way in which this has been managed, this is which the, the way in which this will, will, will be led. I come back to answering your original question, which says, the experience of young people who are supposed to benefit from the impact of these things is going to be diminished. Uh, I, again, I would echo what's been said so far. Uh, the biggest cost to um, running uh, the education budget is obviously staff. And uh, I think wherever staff could be cut, they have been cut. Uh, that includes QIOs, who did often offer huge amounts of support to schools. But uh, as we've said in our statement, they would do things like uh, carry out investigations through discipline, grievance and so on. They've disappeared, which means that the pressure is backed onto HR to find other suitable people to allocate these duties to. And we're finding that our members, through it could be an allegation that was completely unfounded, they're having to wait months and months and months before they have an outcome from that. Uh, that, that obviously adds pressure and stress and can mean that sometimes people are on um, suspension, precautionary suspension at home for months and end, which is a cost to the authority. Um, pupil support through the removal of pupil support as Larry said through behaviour can mean there's an increase in violent incidents also because of teacher stress it's very difficult to deal with these incidents in the class and also when you're referring you find that the people you're referring to are busy with other things that maybe in the past somebody else took up the reins of. So we're, we're very concerned at a time when there are huge changes through national qualifications and so on. People are full of good intentions, but even the, the patience of the, and the goodwill of the, the most obliging teachers has been stretched. They've got standards they've set themselves. They've got a way they want to teach the pupils, and they're finding that all the resources are being pulled away, not only the staffing resources to, to support them, but the physical resources, books and so on, things they want to do, they just can't do. Okay, thank you. If, if members um, could keep their questions short, and the answer is reasonably short, and if somebody's already caught, covered it, then I would appreciate if you don't go back over the same ground. Mary, do you have anything more you have to? Okay. <coughs> One supplementary, um, and I'll lump a few points in, but obviously you can choose what you want to answer. Um, it was just the previous panel uh, mentioned that the two main uh, issues in attainment were parental engagement and the quality of teaching. And uh, Ian Ellis, the chair of the National Parent Forum for Scotland, said that, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you know we need to get better at uh, dealing with uh, teachers who do or don't perform well enough. Or, um, I hope I put that right. Um, but, uh, Larry, in your evidence, you say there's 4,000 less, fewer teachers uh, between 2007 and 14. Um, also, the school estate 
uh, according to the Audit Scotland report, 18% of the school estate in poor or bad condition, no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring progress from pupils from P1 to S3. So it's really, do we really know enough about, you know, can we compare like with like? And uh, also the Audit Scotland report, no independent evaluation on how much councils spend on education and what this delivers in terms of improved attainment and wider achievement. Um, so I, I think I'll probably just leave it there, but these are the issues that are concerning me, apart from centrally employed teachers are up by 400 and uh, teachers in preschool education down by 12%. So I'm trying to make sense of all these figures uh, and looking at attainment as well. And to ask you, you know, have Audit Scotland got it wrong? Because they seemed, they just found it impossible to look at the spend and what that delivers in terms of attainment. So is there some magic bullet there that we perhaps don't know about? Um, I'll just leave it there for you to choose. These are my main concerns, so whatever. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is, yeah. I'm trying to think what bit to, to, to answer. I, I think in terms of um, attainment, it is quite difficult to identify the, the spend and how the attainment comes about because I think the, the way a school is run can make huge differences. The, the support of parents can make huge differences. So I think it's quite difficult to say um, what is making the difference. Uh, yes, uh, again, I won't rehearse what I've already said, but the experience across the country being different, just depending on the way in which things are targeted within individual local authorities, is a problem, and it has been a problem for some time. Um, in terms of the, the uh, local accountability, um, we were, we were uh, quite uh, pleased that Audit Scotland were doing the report in the first place, because I think it's the first time they've ever really looked in depth. And I do know from meetings with them, they quite often struggle to get the information. Um, I think part of the issue is because of the lack of ring fencing, it's difficult to identify how much uh, was spent in a period of time on education. And I do know from, from having worked on, the, uh, looked at the report, that even the local authority found it difficult at times to specifically give figures. And I do wonder if there is a, a need for a bit more of a central kind of overview. Um, a, a lot of what Jim suggested around the postcode lottery could be prevented around that. I think, I think that uh, maybe there needs to be a more national accountability uh, type of regime reinstated, if you like. There, there used to be a, a poster which was popular in schools um, in the late 80s through the 90s, which said not, not everything which counts uh, can be measured and not everything that's me that measured counts or something like that. You, you get the idea. It was, it was the notion of, uh, and this is when we were focused on targets constantly, it was the notion that there was more to education than just measuring uh, targets. Uh, and one of the difficulties with Audit Scotland report, I think, is that it, 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 it goes for what it can measure and it struggles with the nuance of how you deliver education, um, which is always a difficulty. But there are things that, which I think would bring some uh, rational approach to uh, how we deliver education. Um, we mentioned already teacher numbers. One of the things that the EIS has called for is, is national minimum st uh, teaching standard so that th there is a basic uh, uh, teaching number in relation to pupils which has to be applied across local authorities. And if local authorities want to enhance that, that would be a local decision. But in the same way that we have national paying conditions, we think there should be a national staffing standard. Because if you look at local authorities, one of the variable factors is the staffing ratio that they use the staffing formula that they use to judge how many staff they need to deliver a curriculum. And it can vary quite significantly. Uh, and that, that is a direct relation to, to teacher numbers. The, the reference to um, the quality of teachers. I mean, Scottish education has never been better served by the quality of its teachers. The professional update that Jim referred to, which is now in operation, um, has been developed by General Teaching Council for Scotland. There is a framework there for, for teacher competence. Um, and there are clear professional standards where if a teacher is in breach of them, there are, there are procedures in place. 
But actually, I, I, would, I would confidently say that we have never had a better qualified uh, or a more committed staff uh, across the country than we have at the present. Very briefly, Jim. Just, just uh, the point that Larry's made there, I'd hope to make it earlier on, and it's to answer the question about t teacher quality. It's not just to do with the fact that General Teaching Council have put this into place. It's to do with the psyche within the Scottish teaching profession. And that we have now had over 12 years now of NQTs coming into the profession, trained in a certain way, viewing the job in a certain way, and to them, the whole notion of professional update is just a natural extension of the way in which they've been brought into the profession. Thank you. Uh, Gordon, did you want to come in here? It's a very quick question. Um, I asked this question of the, the earlier panel, and it was suggested by them that I ask yourself. So, uh, <laughs> so well, you know, it's straightforward anyway. Um, Scottish Government during the summer introduced the Access to Education Fund to specifically help pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I'm just wondering about what's the level of awareness in schools about that fund and what's the uptake in, in your view? Just very I'm not sure the level of awareness was that high. I know that we um, did try and raise uh, the profile of it, but I think the time scale came to, it came to us quite late, and, and I think that I'm sure an email went out, and they literally had a couple of weeks to to get bids in. So I think I would have been concerned about maybe the time scale of the announcement and when the actual bids were due in. Yeah, the, the time was not good. The time was yeah. not helpful. Yeah. There are a number of initiatives on the go in terms of closing the attainment gap, the school improvement partnership. Um, which had funding of, I think, a million pound uh, over a three-year. And these are all worthwhile projects. Um, I, I've just finished reading the report, which is based on the, an evaluation of the London Challenge, which is credited with uh, a huge increase in performance of, of London schools. It, it was resourced by literally billions of pounds. Mm -hmm. Billions of pounds. So whilst we would never oppose any of these initiatives around... Uh, tackling the impact of poverty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, they are they are just papering over the cracks, because unless you invest the type of resource that you saw in the London Challenge, then you're not going to get that kind of systematic change, which is necessary to, to address the levels of poverty we have in Scottish society. Twenty percent of mm -hmm. kids at schools coming from what is de defined as absolute poverty. So you know, that, that there's a huge barrier there, and and I don't I, I don't think that. Our current funding formula in terms of local authorities gives adequate weight into the, the issue of, of poverty in terms of uh, councils. I mean, back when I, when I was a councillor, back when we had Strathclyde Region, I think there was a much greater attempt then to redistribute money to areas of priority treatment, as they were referred to then. Um, since we've gone to unitary authorities, I don't think the impact of poverty in particular areas has been a su sufficient factor in how the local government funding is distributed. Okay. The, the other thing that I think is important is that um, previously breakfast clubs were a really good way of getting kids into school early in the morning and getting them ready for learning and uh, an awful lot of them have disappeared too because of cuts in staffing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, Convener. I would like to talk about the solutions to the budgetary challenges that we face, uh, what we can look at. I think uh, the NES, NES UWT sum it up perfectly when they say the draft budget of the Scottish Government is in the context of Westminster Government's flawed economic strategy of ideological driven cuts to funding. Couldn't agree more. With, uh, with that, but some of the things that we discussed uh, previously with the previous panel was uh, the local authorities, uh, as a former councillor myself, I'm only too aware that if you make a mistake or you make a, an error in judgment when you're dealing with the education budget, it will come back and bite you. You know, because the parents and the teachers will uh, tell you exactly. Now, surely I, I would learn, I've learned from that, the engagement with teachers, parents and pupils is probably the best for way forward with the budgetary uh, side of things. But we've heard from some of the parents groups that that's not happening at a local level. And I would have said probably that would be the way forward to ensure that, look, what do you need? How, as the professionals that are delivering education, what in this challenging time 
Do you need to, the tools to do the job correctly? Now, how do you feel that's happening across the nation? Or is it happening? Or just like the, the parents groups and the youth representatives saying that it probably isn't? I mean, I think there are a few different challenges uh, in there. Um, for example, uh, I heard the Cabinet Secretary when he was here a few weeks ago say that he uh, wished to maintain teacher numbers if, in fact, he would expand them if it was possible. Um, and that was welcome. But we now have a, a working group which is looking at setting aside the national agreement on protecting teacher numbers. Um, and the COSLA paper makes very clear that their agenda is around what they regard as local flexibility, which is just another way of saying that they want the door open so they can push it cutting teacher numbers. Now, if you... You know, you, we are real we are happy to discuss those issues, but we're not going to agree to them mm. because the, the national agreement around teacher numbers was part of a very significant settlement in 2011 that lost that, that, that saw cuts to teachers' conditions uh, and certainly we've seen the, the, the wage restraints since then. So we welcome negotiations, but there are certain red lines, uh, and we are very clear that the, if you reduce teacher numbers you are going to impact upon the service that's been delivered. There's a, a lot of comment uh, around the quote that the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. But you have to factor in there also the number. You know, So teacher numbers is an area where we're very clear. The other issue in the COSLA paper, and again, this is about consultation, that one of the things they float in there is basically a, a reduction in the, the primary week, which is what happened, the, the idea that was developed in Renfrewshire. Yes, that's where I was bitten, and the, I've learned uh, that the, 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 uh, <laughs> You know, and again, I mean, there are severe financial pressures on every uh, level of government, but going to part-time education for our primary pupils is not the answer to it. And I think one of the issues that, that doesn't get discussed is, is around how you raise additional funding, because public sector services are, fund, are based on taxation. Now, there is a, there's, I think there's a huge debate around the uh, the, the council tax freeze. Um, we don't have a position on it. it. It was a political decision to offer the council tax <coughs> freeze. But it's a, so, it's a source of income which has been denied uh, to local authorities. And I know the Scottish Government subvent that decision, uh, but the money they use for the subvention is money that could be used elsewhere. Now, it's, it's an area which I think has to be debated. Um, there's a huge debate going on around what powers the Scottish Government are going to have. But there's only pur purpose in having those powers if you use them. The Scottish Government already have the power to vary the, the uh, tax. But it's never, you know, the Scottish executive never used it. The Scottish Government don't use it. If, if we want to have the local services that are important to us, then they have to be funded. Uh, you know, and I think that's a debate that needs to open up a little bit. In terms of the um, importance of education, I think that has to be looked at. I, I mean, part of our consultation, is, as you rightly said, was there is a recognition that it isn't just, you know, an issue because of the Scottish Government. It's been created by the Westminster team. But that doesn't, that's not a get out for the Scottish Government. And I think we need to be clear on that. Um, and maybe this is back to my kind of point about ring fencing. I, you know, I think... There needs to be a bigger look at what else is being spent. I mean, I sort of facetiously refer to it as the fluffy stuff. You know, what's important? And education is one of the most important things. So it should have the most amount of money, and health, obviously, and other things. But, you know, how much are councils spending on things that aren't actually necessary? To come back to the engagement with parents... Um, we did a, a survey which was not Scotland-specific. It was the rest of the UK because it was in particular focus on the uh, issues they had with their own uh, education crisis there. And it was about the cost of education to parents. And I actually took part in it because I'm an employee just out of interest. And I hadn't realised that the, co the cost of my daughter's education to me in the past year has been over £1,000. 
Now, that's an unsustainable figure for any parent, regardless of income. But I think there needs to be a recognition that a lot of parents are funding things that should be being funded uh, you know, from education. Musician tuition, for instance, there's another uh, ad hoc arrangement. Some authorities provide it free. We have to pay for it in, in my council. And all of these things have a knock-on effect. And so it's technically that's a saving, but where has the money gone that, that parents are now contributing to? Um, because it's not going into education. It's, it's being used elsewhere. So I think we need to maybe look at readdressing the focus in some way. Okay, Jim. Okay. Uh, to, to come back to your, your original question, you cannot, regardless of what system it is, whether it's education, health, or whatever, any other system which is publicly funded, keep putting increasing demands onto it and expect those demands to be met by the same or a decreasing sum of money to do it. If you go to any teacher and ask them, you know, what would you need to be able to do this? They will tell you, and it's been the same ever since I came into teaching, I need time or I need money. Now, essentially, both come down to money. So you cannot keep putting into the system more and more demands on people and expecting the quality and the outcome to keep going up if you do not support them and sustain them and be able to do that. Coming back to you know, local authority and local authority funding, I think I started off by saying I've got no great, or well, my organisation has got no great complaint over the whole notion of doing away with ring fencing. I know, working in Dundee, that five miles up the road in Angus, the demands on education in Angus are going to be different from the demands in education within Dundee. Hence, the local authorities have got to have some sort of flexibility, some sort of wriggle room to be able to meet and address the demands which are specific to their area. Very different across a, count, a, a local authority boundary. So surely there must be some kind of look at saying, OK, within Scotland, there are some, there is a set of parameters there which says within these parameters, the service must be delivered and your local authority have got the opportunity to be able to deliver something which better meets the needs of the young people in your area rather than having it sort of tied down into sort of separate compartments where we all know when we got to the end of the financial year, you had to sort of justify things and shift it around so you could get it spent. That was obviously daft as well. Let's look at parameters within the funding formula, within the staffing formula formula which lets local authorities and schools better need the need, meet the needs of their own pupils. Okay. Uh, we, I must say we feel exactly the same. That although the central government clearly uh, allocate a certain amount of money to the Scottish government, the Scottish government does have some um, choices it can make itself. But uh, I feel that uh, in professional associations we feel that we're defending our members uh, conditions of service at every turn and in fact teachers are quite often seen as uh, a barrier uh, and as a cost rather than as you know people that go out there to teach children and, and trying to do the right thing. Uh, I know that maybe in, relatively speaking teachers can seem expensive but they're very well educated, very well meaning, well intentioned who, people who give a huge amount of their own time and including their own money. We know that teachers buy sometimes their own resources. They want to have a certain standard in the classrooms and they will back it up with their own money in a time when they have lost probably 16% in terms of real uh, pay over the past six or seven years. Thank you very much. From a, I mentioned at the last panel as well, from a local authority point of view, the, the Holy Grail was shared services, but coming from Renfrewshire, uh, the Renfrewshire, the Lanarkshires and Inverclyde, we've, we've not managed to get it working. Now, surely uh, in education, there must be a way that local authorities that are working so close together, delivering a very similar service, there must be a way that they should be able to deliver the service uh, by doing that. It can't obviously be rocket science, but for some reason, local authorities seem to be making a lot of hard work. And I admit the time that I was uh, in administration, it was going well, and then all of a sudden it became difficult to share some of these services. So what would be your uh, opinions on that? Because obviously that is what local authority management would say is the holy grail on the way forward, or a way forward. One of the... I think there has been very poor progress in terms of shared services. Um, but one of the issues, I think, is around uh, the different corporate identities of different local authorities. Uh, because 
in a couple of the experiments where there's been an attempt to look at shared services, uh, or even uh, you know one where there's a, a shared director, the difficulty was the political context in which that person had to operate. So in a sense, there are two sets of, of masters, you know, in terms of, uh, especially when one of the councils involved uh, ended up with a different political leadership from the uh, from the other. So you know, so there there are some practical difficulties uh, around um, around that agenda. In a lot of areas, one of the challenges for local authorities is understanding that teachers have national conditions of service, national pay bargaining, which doesn't apply to most other local authority workers. Um, and because of the statutory nature of the education service, there are, there are things which corporate directors can't do in education, uh, which I think some of them find is a, a frustration uh, because one of the agendas in the bigger authorities like Glasgow that we are constantly fighting is the, the corporate approach to education. Um, which is largely predicated on cost savings, but actually ends up with a poorer service. And if you look at supply teachers, for example, is a perfect example. Uh, in order to run pro a supply service to schools, you need to be in tune with schools. If you try and run it just as a personnel function, you end up not meeting the demands of the schools. So, you know, I, I, I agree with you that there is still great potential around the shared services agenda. But I think the difficulty, the difficulty doesn't lie, doesn't lie, I think, in terms of the teachers in the classroom. The difficulties lie in terms of the, the political mm. machines of the local authorities because that's where the disagreement, uh, that's where the, the obstacles appear to, uh, appear to appear, if you know what I mean. Okay. Um, Neil Thunley. No, sorry, Neil. Neil Bibby, I apologise. Oh. <laughs> There was, there was Neil, no, Neil used to say the other. There was no offence taken there at all. Um, can I um, ask uh, about about workload issues and, and teacher numbers? Um, I think um, you've all raised concerns about teacher teacher workload. I think um, EIS have referred to the workload crisis. NASUWT have talked about a ticking time bomb in relation to uh, workload issues. Um, Larry's already mentioned what the Education Secretary said last time he was at the committee in terms of his, um, his statement about wanting to maintain if, uh, and, if possible, increase teacher numbers. Um, we had the budget, and obviously this is budget scrutiny today, we had the budget a couple of days after that, and uh, Mr Swinney did not mention anything specifically about teacher numbers in his, uh, in his statement, and um, I've questioned him on that uh, at the time. Um, You've obviously mentioned what's happened since the the budget. Um, can I ask you: is is there still an expectation from yourselves that there should be an increase in teacher numbers uh, following the uh, cabinet secretary's statement? And you know, we've talked about we've seen statistics around the, you know, several thousand fewer teachers over the past uh, number of years since two thousand and seven. Is there a, a a figure? I appreciate there's there's other issues around workload, around bureaucracy, etc. But obviously, teacher numbers is a, a critical issue. Is there a number of additional teachers that are needed um, in our education system to help uh, address that workload crisis uh, that that has been discussed? I'll start along here, Jim. Okay, I'll come, come back to something which I mentioned already. I'm, I'm quite sure my colleagues around me will pick up teacher <coughs> workload crisis. I want to pick up the school leader workload crisis and school leader number crisis. And that over the, the past six or seven years, there's been a significant reduction in leadership capacity within schools, a time when workload, capacity, you know, workload is increasing, and inc increasing enormously. There's a huge issue around about career progression and senior, senior, senior leadership within schools. People are looking at it and saying, you know, do I want to take on a head teacher's job, a deputy's job, if that's what it's going to involve? So there's a, you know, my organisation has got a, you know, a quite significant concern around about that. And you know, come back to the whole notion of guidance teachers, for example, and the way in which they are being expected to operate within the new structures which are coming along. Again, an increasing pressure with a de declining number of people within guidance structures within schools. So leadership capacity is a major issue. 
it's exacerbated by the removal of leadership capacity at the centre within local authorities. Removal of education officers and curriculum support officers and so on pushes that back onto schools to be done. It is a major and increasing issue. And the whole notion of the job sizing toolkit and the inappropriateness of the job sizing toolkit to support senior leaders in the way in which they are paid in relation to the workload which they take on is an ongoing and an increasingly overbearing issue within school leadership in Scotland. Fiona? Uh, yeah, in, in terms of teacher numbers, I think one of the biggest advantages would be if we had a better supply of supply teachers. Uh, and I think it's been extremely difficult to encourage people to put their name on the list. The pay is not as good for a couple of days. The, the jobs that are advertised tend to be temporary. Nobody's going to give up a permanent job to, to go for a couple of days a week to a particular school. The knock-on effect of that is that things like CPD or career-long professional learning doesn't happen. You know, you may be booked on a course to, to bring up your subject knowledge and there's nobody to cover your class. So what, what choice do you make? You stay in the school and you give up your professional learning. So in order to allow the capacity for staff to maintain their professional update and to maintain the standards that we want, we need to encourage uh, people into teaching by making sure it's a profession that looks attractive, that doesn't look as stressful as it looks at the moment, and that the, there's good career opportunities. The, the change in uh, the structure through doing away with subject-specific principal teachers has had a knock-on effect. You could have a, a newly qualified teacher going into school now who uh, doesn't have a subject-specific line manager. It's very difficult to develop that if you happen to be a one-person um, department. So the, the structure doesn't encourage that movement upwards either. So um, I, I think in terms of budget, we, we just need to have another look at what, what's available and the support that's given in that department. Thank you. Jane? Yeah, following on from both Jim and Fiona, actually the, the, the cuts in uh, leadership uh, and, and middle management have had a really massive impact on teacher workload because where they're taking away the principal teacher role, um, or where there's a shared headship uh, scenario in rural areas or whatever, which is not a, a concept that we are against. But the workload that would have normally been done by that person falls to the class teacher, and it increases their workload, and they're not being paid for it either. So I'm, I think I'd find it very difficult to sit here and give you a number, Neil, because it would probably be completely out, <laughs> out with the realms of possibility. But I think that there's ve that it's about the redistribution of the posts that are available. And that varies council to council as well, depending on their situation. So where a council can say, well, we've got X amount of teachers, I think the real impact is in what type of teachers they have, what roles the teachers have, uh, how much uh, provision they have for support staff and supply staff. So it's you know a whole... Th a uh, ream of things rolled into one that have the, the impact. The agreement that was reached in 2011 around teacher numbers was that teacher numbers would be maintained in line with um, uh, pupil numbers. And there was a mechanism put in place by Scottish Government whereby if local authorities didn't uh, maintain their specific number of teachers, there would be a clawback of roughly £40,000 for every one who lived below that. Now, there was some flexibility around different authorities, how you produced the overall figure. Um, but that, that direct connection has actually ensured that over the three years, or over the two years that it's operated so far, teacher numbers have been largely maintained. Some authorities have gone up a little bit, some have gone down. And we'll know uh, this December whether it's been maintained for this current year. What, what was proposed in the budget was that that, that penalty would be suspended uh, for 2015-16, but it's predicated upon discussions involving the teacher trade unions around causal agenda for an outcomes-based uh, system of, of measuring you know, education delivery. We are prepared to have those discussions. Well, we're very clear that, and it's almost back to the Audit Scotland, there are some things that you should be able to measure uh, that are useful benchmarks. 
And from our point of view, teacher numbers uh, is one of the benchmarks in terms of uh, education spending. Uh, there should be an increase in the primary numbers because of the increase in role. Uh, if, if that increase isn't there, it means you have bigger classes uh, and the impact that that has on teaching and learning. Um, there, may, there might be expected to be a decrease in secondary, but one of the difficulties with secondary staffing is that you have to maintain a level of staff to deliver curriculum choice. So that, you know that it's, it can be complicated in terms of how it's worked out. But, but certainly, we were, I, I welcome the uh, Cabinet Secretary's commitment on teacher numbers. Um, and we are very clear that from an EIS point of view, that is one of the litmus tests in terms of the acceptability of the budget, that we do actually have a agreement on maintenance of, uh, of teacher numbers, at least in line with pupil roles. Yeah. And in terms of an increase in primary teachers, is there a, a number that you think that the, the Scottish Government should be looking at in terms of an increase in te uh, teacher numbers for primary schools, given the increase in primary school roles? No, no I, and again, it relates to one of the issues around the budget discussions is that there's been a request that local negotiating committees have a look at this issue because it does, it, the, in, the necessary increase will relate to local circumstance. So if you're in a rural situation, uh, you, you, might have, you might be able to increase people by 10 in a rural school uh, without requiring another teacher because the class sizes. Uh, in a, in a, an urban setting, an increase of three might mean you have to have a second stream class. So, you know, there, there are a lot of detail there that they do make it difficult. I mean, anyone who's been involved in workforce planning for teachers will know that the difficulty of coming up with a formula actually deals with all the nuances. But that, again, that's why we think that, you know, a minimum staffing standard across the country is a useful starting point for how local authorities then look at, uh, you know, the, the, the nuance of their area. Thank you very much. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just looking at... Uh, we've, we've touched on national and local decision-making and we've sort of skittered around ring fencing and so on. And It's true that the Scottish Government provides the block grant to local authorities, but within that, a great deal of the budget is actually decided nationally, i.e. the teachers' salaries. To what extent do you think the Scottish Government should really be uh, intervening at local level in schools. I mean, we have this. We have. We, al we always have this feeling that uh, local government locally is best at delivering that service, and yet we already know parts of it are are dealt with nationally in terms of costings and so on. Do you think that the Scottish government should influence local authorities more than they do now in terms of the spend? I, mean, I, I think uh, it's a $64,000 question, really, isn't it? Um, the, I, I think the primary role of government in terms of education is around policy so that we have a coherent curriculum framework across the country. We, we have always taken the view that there is a, an appropriate role for local authorities in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the democratic process and accountability. I think there probably is a debate around, and it's almost back to the shared services, you know, that uh, there probably will be a debate now around at what level that local democratic control should, should be exercised. But um, there seems to be little point in actually having local councils if they don't actually have any decision-making powers. So, you know, we, we think that local authorities are uh, a key part of the decision-making process. Uh, that's not to say we agree with the decisions they're making, um, you know, but we think they, they have the right to make them. Yes. You know, just the, the, the whole notion of a local authority to be there to be able to judge the needs of the local community and to be accountable for the way in which these needs are met is crucial to the democratic process. Yes, central government gives a steer. Yes, central government sets the policy. And just with the nature of things, and that, you know, they are in charge of the, the national finance. And the large chunk of what is paid for is teacher salaries. Yes, central government has got that, that, that sort of impact as well. But there must be the opportunity for local authorities with 
the schools within that local authority with the various other agencies within that local authority to start to work together to provide a service which meets the needs of the, the pupils who attend the schools in that local authority. That you would oppose ring fencing in order to think, keep that flexibility locally that think, local authorities can determine local needs. I think what I've suggested earlier on in, the, in relation to a kind of set of parameters, Larry's already mentioned it in relation to staffing. It's not beyond, beyond having a kind of set of parameters. Do a way would not have the ring fencing as such, which was very, very restrictive. Don't have the complete flexibility, which allows the, the smoke and mirrors, which were, were spoken about when the parents' body were sitting here earlier on, but a set of parameters within which local authority can operate and within which local authority can be held accountable. I think would be a useful way forward. Yeah. Ring fence, and a good example of ring fencing was there used to be additional money came from Scottish Government around uh, English as an additional language, and, and that money was specifically for that national priority around supporting English as EAL. And it meant in Glasgow, for example, all Glasgow funded to the tune of six million additional EAL services. It had a core funding from Scottish Government. And when the staffing formula, staffing uh, complements were being worked out in schools, that Scottish Government element was untouchable because it was ring fenced to that service. One of the things that's happened with the removal of ring fencing is that that, that additional funding is now just part of the, the local authority budget. And one of the consequences has been a cut in the EAL staff in Glasgow City Council. So uh, I, think, I think in certain areas, ring fencing. Uh, is, is desirable and, and is, is an acceptable mechanism for, for Scottish Government to use where it is driving a particular policy issue. And the, the, the other thing just to mention is, although somebody like teachers' salaries, for example, are negotiated nationally, they're negotiated in the SNCT, which is a tripartite body. So COSLA is one-third of that body. So, you know, it's not the unions and Scottish Government, it's... The, the unions, Scottish government, and local government in a tripartite negotiation. So it's not; it's more than just a two-way process in terms of Scottish government down the way. Wouldn't outcome agreements really be the, the litmus test as to whether the money being spent is effective, as opposed to ring fencing, which just holds a certain sum of money available? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I think outcome agreements are just smoke and mirrors. I mean, I, I, there was a question earlier about the, the, the national priorities. You know, the, the, the worry I have around outcome agreements is that they can be so nebulous, right, that they don't actually mean anything. Um, you know, and that, I mean, that is the agenda that COSLA have set up for the forthcoming discussions. Um, and when, when I first heard about it, my, my response was, well, what do they mean by that? And nobody could quite tell me what it means. Uh, you know, so... The, uh, you know, it's a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll engage in the dialogue, but uh, you know, I, sometimes I think that's just a way of, of masking a different agenda. Okay. Claire Adamson. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, if I could just touch back, I mean, obviously um, we were asking about ring fencing and the whole, whole budget situation, and Larry, you did mention the council tax freeze earlier on, but um, COSLA have, have been quite clear in their... Um, submission about looking at things holistically. So given that the council tax is only 10.8% of funding for local government, and given that the Scottish government contribution <coughs> to that means that, for instance, the last time I was involved with North Lanarkshire you're looking at it, just to stand still, that would be a 6% increase for everyone on their council tax. So to actually raise money for it, you're talking about levels of, of maybe a 10% increase in council tax. Um, so, so the other thing that's come up today is a quarter of our pupils are living in poverty at the moment. The 16% drop in teacher numbers. And, and is it not, do, you, do you not have to look at it in the whole and what impact that would have on teachers, on, on parents in terms of the increase in the council tax, given that up until now somebody in Bandy has saved £690 on council tax because of the freeze that was brought in by the government? I'm, I'm not... Um advocating that the council tax freeze should end. I'm saying there needs to be a debate around uh, taxation. Right? And I just use that as an example of something that's, that exists. Um, we don't actually have a policy on it, 
right? Because we understand why it was introduced. Um, but it's, it was the point that if you're going to fund public services, the, the money has to come from somewhere. And I don't think you can escape the, the fact at the end of the day, taxation, some form of taxation, is, is that source. I'm not necessarily saying the council tax freeze is the, uh, is the issue. I just use it as an illustration. I think I probably ought to declare an interest is uh, I have two family members, a current secondary school teacher and a former uh, head secondary school uh, teacher, both union members. Um, just to Which union? My, well, <laughs> mainly because I'm not sure I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to be that specific. Um, in terms of the, the point you were making earlier, um, Larry, about the difference in 2014-15 uh, with the removal of the sanctions. Obviously, there are discussions ongoing, and you've made clear where you stand on that. Um, but in light of what the Cabinet Secretary told the committee um, three, four weeks back, what is your expectation that um, that teacher-pupil ratio will remain um, as agreed back in 2010-11? Um, is, there, is there a risk that without the sanctions, was the sanctions in place, um, the, the, the thing that kept everybody honest? Um, or have you any fears at all that with the removal of that, there is a risk that, that, uh, uh, that those numbers will not keep, uh, keep track of, uh, of people numbers? Well, I mean, I, th I think there are two key areas there. One is um, there's been a five-month period set for discussions. Um, but those discussions will also be parallel on the discussions in the SNCT around the teacher's pay claim. Um, it will also in the context of our workload campaign and CFE. So there's going to be, I think, quite a lot of uh, detailed discussions um, around that. Um, it, I mean, I would hope that we would have an agreement in place at the end of it, which still saw protection around teacher numbers. Uh, I, I, at the TUC Congress this year, uh, Mark Carney uh, was invited to be a speaker. But one of his observations was that uh, living standards have fallen uh, in terms of the response to austerity, but it was almost as if people have accepted that in order to protect job numbers. Um, and certainly, from our point of view, that protection around job numbers is the only thing which mitigates against the, the fall in, in living standards. Uh, so, it's, so it is an important area for us. The other side of it um, is that Although we have this protection around the 2011 teacher numbers, and I think Jane uh, referred to earlier, that, you know, there, there's not much more to cut. You know, we, we, those teacher numbers, uh, we would argue, are, are you know, basically what you need to deliver the statutory requirements of the education service. So, quite where cause I think there might be. A, I mean, they're, they're not saying this, but you know, this is what they're thinking. But you know, where they think there might be real additional savings through cutting teacher numbers. Uh, you know, it's difficult to, to identify where that is unless it's an individual authorities because the, uh, the, the numbers already uh, are delivering a service which is creaking under the pressure of workload and growing class sizes. So, I, I, you know, the, it, might also, it might almost be a false war in the sense of uh, th those numbers may not be able to change very much. Comment on that? Yes, Fiona. Uh, in terms of teacher numbers, I think the, the effect certainly in secondary schools is that um, because of the subject choices, subjects can be put in a particular way where it's difficult for pupils to choose them. And that's what we're finding. Subjects are dropping off the end, uh, mm -hmm. which means that maybe the school can say, well, we don't need that teacher anymore because, in fact, nobody was choosing the subject. But if we want pupils to have a broad education and lots of choices, then we have to sometimes maintain classes where there may not be a huge number, but it's necessary in order to, to maintain the pupils' education to give them these choices. Mm. Can, I, can I just move this on to the solutions? I think George and, and, and to an extent Colin were touching on this earlier. If there were any easy solutions, mm -hmm. to some extent we might not even need to invite you here to give us some answers. But... Um, uh, we've we've heard um, Larry, you talking about the, the council tax. Then Claire explaining how this was very difficult and and, and wouldn't be terribly pleasant. Um, in terms of uh, shared services, there's issues around um, democratic deficits at a at a at a local level. Uh, in terms of um, trying to maintain some national parameters, 
uh, well, that builds rigidity into the into the system. Doesn't necessarily allow uh, local authorities or individual head teachers and their and their senior staff to to adapt a, a degree of flexibility to to meet their their local needs. In terms of ring fencing, um, I, I, I take your point about Glasgow, Larry. But um, with ring fencing, places like Orkney were being presented with small pots of money that were good for absolutely nothing. Uh, but because they were ring fenced, they couldn't be deployed in more in more creative ways. So there are there are swings and roundabouts with it, and I, I, I appreciate that they're different for different councils. But given all of that, um, can you perhaps guide us? in some direction in terms of the sorts of recommendations that we could be making through this inquiry to say, look, there aren't going to be huge new pots of, of, of funding found, or if you can identify where perhaps we should be looking to say um, there, are, there are areas where it, we're just not getting the bang for the buck, or there's, uh, there's areas where in terms of the centrality to educational uh, attainment and achievement, um, that the, the money would be better spent elsewhere that would allow us to, to go back to, to, to government and say, look, none of this is easy, but these are, these are the areas where you ought to be refocusing efforts. I think part of the answer to that is to go back to the point I made before, where I think more in-depth look at specific spend on certain items locally, and is there an area where you could use the money better to, to take forward, you know, increasing... Uh, the provision of education and I'm not entirely sure that that's been done consistently I think that uh, there has to be an open and honest exchange about the budgets and expenditure and as I said I was concerned to hear that doesn't happen um, and I, I don't think we have magic answers either um, mm -hmm. apart from ones that just wouldn't be achievable but I just my my, my feeling is that there are there is money being spent on things that aren't necessarily a priority, maybe just through because it's always happened or it's something else, and I just think it needs to be re-looked at. If you're only getting a finite amount, mm -hmm. then it has to be really carefully distributed and, and you know, focused on that. But uh, is there a, is an issue? I mean, you, you touched on instrument tuition mm -hmm. earlier on. Now, I'm in the fortunate position that the authority um, in the area I represent has has and continues to, mm -hmm. to to cover the costs of that. I know that they're in a in a minority in that uh, respect, um, but in a sense, at a local level, those different priorities um, are going to be taken. They're going to be assessed, presumably, on the basis of what uh, in in that local authority area they feel um, they need to uh, invest in uh, in order of priority and where. They, they, they think there is a, a stomach for charging for certain things and they, they, they put forward those proposals and, and are held accountable to them. So, sorry, can I come back? Yeah, so it, where, what's the comparison then in the authority that cuts that provision to the one that can still provide it? Where is the saving being made for the one that can still provide it to allow them to provide it free of cost? Maybe there needs to be more interaction interaction between different authorities on what are their successes you know what what is it they've managed to retain without cutting and and i know that i'm not naive enough to think that's simple to do because of the different natures of of authorities but if one if one uh, area is able to continue provision of that and another area is not then you're getting into an inequality of access to education uh, that's available to young people in Scotland, and again, it comes back to the postcode lottery. So, but, but that's—I uh, mean, it's interesting you say that. And in the, in the, the previous panel again were, were, were emphasising where there can be shared learning and shared experience. I mean, one would have thought that, given the process that all local authorities um, have had to go through over the last few years, um, that that dialogue be between them would have been happening as a matter of of, of course. I mean, everybody's yes, you been would struggling. Think that. Yes. But it, your argument it is, it isn't. I'm not. I'm no. not convinced it is. No. Right. But I mean, in which case are there exemplars? Are there local authorities that that, that we should be holding up as examples of where, um, despite a range of factors, they are exceeding expectations. They're they're delivering and not necessarily with massively more resources than anywhere else. Can I just on the back of that question? I think it's, it's another angle to the same question. You mentioned Eugene a couple of times now. But earlier on, you said sp local authority spending on fluffy I services think, yeah. um, and um, just uh, a moment ago about in terms of spending on areas which are maybe of less priority. Could you give us examples of what these 
areas of less priority or fluffy services are? <laughs> fluffy is the wrong terminology. It's just my own personal one. I mean, if you think across authorities, even about um, what what do they spend on uh, projects uh, for the arts? What do they spend on the types of wheelie bins they provide to the people that live there? You know, each authority's got a different arrangement for that. What's the cost implication? It's about are they taking... Um, teaching jobs and redistributing them to support staff uh, in order to make cuts there. It, it, it's about the exchange of what they're doing and the, and the, the importance of what they're doing. Um, I mean, leafleting that you get through the door from the council about certain things, is there a need for that? You know, and, and I know that that's not all directly <coughs> interlinked, but I just think the whole wider funding issue needs to be looked at. And if we cannot afford to do something... And I know it's been done, and that's my point about there aren't any more efficiencies to be made. It is cuts now, and maybe that has to be the honest response is, you know, we're not looking at efficiencies, we are cutting. So I just think it needs to be... And, and, and to come back to Liam's point, I don't think there's an open exchange across authorities in, in different scenarios where we've been seek, seeking advice on um, the way that notice pay is made in different authorities there's a varying massive varying level of responses from local authorities as to whether they'll share information or not and so maybe there is work for uh, them to do but that's not for us to do okay. um, two points the SEC in its consultations with the finance uh, secretary has consistently identified the uh, small business grant that government gives uh, as something which doesn't create any jobs uh, and is a pot of money which could be used to support public services. Um, the SEC would probably have an internal disagreement about where you redirect it to, but I would certainly be arguing for um, Scottish education. So there are macro decisions that are made around the amount of money that's spent. Um, there's been a commitment this year around the Woods Commission, the Wood Commission, uh, which we welcome because there's no point in having the Commission if you're not going to resource it. But there again has been a decision taken to support that particular thing. Now, there are, there are projects on the go in Scottish education which are worthwhile, but you'd have to say, are they, are they, re, are they actually realisable? Um, one plus two language initiative. Nobody has any disagreement with it in, in, in real terms. Has it got any chance of succeeding in the next five, ten years? Absolutely not, because the level of resource that's required to turn that into a reality... It's flying in the face of the discussion we're having here around the, you know, the context in which Scottish schools are operating. Um, I, I'm now five minutes late for a, a meeting on the Tackling Bureaucracy Working Group. Um, and, and one, one five of the, minutes well spent, <laughs> Larry. But one, but, one, but one of the points we've been, one of the points we've been saying uh, in that group is that schools have to pick their priorities and do those priorities well. And it might mean not doing something that you actually would like to do and you see as worthwhile, but you just simply don't have the time to do it. Uh, and I, I, I think there is an issue there around, you know, we, have, we, we tick all the boxes in terms of where we're going forward, but we can't afford to fund them all properly, so we fund them a little bit, so we've ticked all the boxes. And maybe we should just focus on, on the key things. And, and the last point, convener, is I, I, I think there is a debate around, again, back to the, the, the shared services agenda, do we really need 32 education directorates across the country? Uh, I, I, I simply ask the question. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring in Jane in the final question. Uh, we'll get everybody to answer. And if there's anything you need to pick up, then, then please do so. Jane. I asked the previous panel to comment on the statement from ADES that due to sensitivities involved, the reality is that draft budgets are now kept largely confidential. And, and the members of that panel made reference to it being all about elections and um, local authorities and, and governments keep things quite close to their chest and then pull rabbits out the hat when it comes close to an election. Do you think there's any ways that we can broaden out that accountability? Obviously, that, that is an accountability through elections, but are there other ways that those involved in school education could, could be held accountable, perhaps more at local level? And are, are there other stakeholders that need to be involved or is it teachers, COSLA and councils? Who else should be involved in that mix? I, I'd have to be honest to say that at a local level and even at a national level, um, from an EIS point of view, we do feel that we are consulted on 
on these major issues, and we do have a, a contribution to make. Um, I, I think some of the sensitivity goes down to local, a uh, local level, and it's where uh, a, a possibility becomes a probability just because it's been articulated. Um, I mean, directorates, the education directors used to be very good at when they, at looking at their, their budget cut options or throwing up stuff that was totally unacceptable just to make sure it was totally unacceptable. The danger they've got now is if they put anything up, it might actually happen. Uh, so, you know, I can understand the level of caution because, you know, from a, representing uh, workers in the, the public sector, you, you don't want to see uh, budget cuts being presented uh, which are going to uh, unsettle people in the workplace. Uh, so, so that is a difficulty. But I think there's a, just a real challenge here for local authorities in terms of how they uh, communicate with different representative groups. Um, I think if you are a representative group, there's an onus on you to, to uh, act in good faith. You know, and if your confidential information is shared with you, that's the basis it's shared with you. Um, I do think just putting everything into the public domain isn't necessarily the best way of conducting what can be quite sensitive, difficult negotiations. I would, I would echo that, uh, Larry, because I think that it depends on the level of understanding of the, the group that you would be presenting it to. I mean, we do get obviously involved in the local uh, information exchange. I'm thinking, you know, if that was rolled out to every householder in, in whatever area, are they going to actually understand the nuances of the decisions that are being made and is it actually relevant to, to what they need to know? So, you know, I think that the level of engagement that exists is, is adequate, but I think as long as it's, it's an open exchange and not, you know, a, 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 the rabbit out the hat analogy, I think, is potentially true in terms of elections, oh, but it's more fluff. <laughs> I like a bit of fluff, <laughs> yes. But I'm not sure that's the, the deliberate agenda at all times. I just think, you know, if, if the question is asked, I think that's what I'm trying to say, if the question is asked through whatever means, then the answer should be given. I think the difficulty sometimes is the speed at which the response comes makes it difficult uh, in the long term. Thank you. Uh, Jim? I don't do fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just to come back, it's perhaps taken off you know, put a wee bit of meat in the bones of, of Larry's point. It's perhaps not the best choice of words from, from Ades, and you know, it could have been phrased in a different way, I would suggest. But if you get to a situation now within the discussions which are happening in relation to cuts, it's not perhaps the best way to go about things to, to throw everything into the public domain. If, for example, you start to look at the school estate and the closure of schools and the delicacy with which that has got to be done, it's just one example of, you know, let's look carefully at what we are going to do and let's look carefully at the way in which we're going to share that with people. As I say, I don't think the wording was perhaps the best in the world. Okay, thank you. And Fiona? Uh, I think the difficulty about uh, holding people to account is, is again, believe it or not, to do with workload. I think there's a lot of people who could contribute an awful lot, but by the time they, can't, they come to go to a meeting, they don't have the time, the energy, they've got other commitments and so on. And quite often what happens, I think, is those that uh, have the, the loudest, more articulate voices are the ones that are listened to. And uh, quite often that's why the decisions are made, because somebody's right in front of the councillor who's, who's got the priority. Thank you, thank you, thank you all very much for coming along this morning, and thank you very much for your written evidence in advance of today. Obviously, you'll know that we will continue our budget deliberations next week. Uh, we'll hear from evidence from COSLA and Adis, and of course from the Scottish Government, the Cabinet Secretary, we here next week. Um, and I'm delighted, Larry, you can now go to your meeting on bureaucracy. Um, uh, that concludes our business for today, and I close the meeting.